recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues uh, for week three. Seems like it's passes so quickly in here uh, most days, and uh, just welcome to all my colleagues and all of those who are tuned in at home uh, to the proceedings today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think it was... Uh, I, I look at irony a lot, and uh, I was looking through my phone today, uh, and uh, one of the pictures that popped up on my phone was a photo that I had taken very early on uh, uh, after being elected uh, with uh, Catherine Kalbeck. Uh, and we were at the Fisherman's Wharf for, uh, uh, for one of the famous uh, Lou McEachern uh, gatherings that hasn't happened for a couple of years, sadly, but, uh, and it brought me, uh, you know, I thought it was a great reflection that today is International uh, Women's Day, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I look around this legislature and I see uh, very strong leaders amongst us here uh, at our cabinet meeting today with Dr. Morrison giving us a briefing. I, I took the time to thank my colleagues uh, and her uh, to say that uh, what a great privilege it's been for me to work so closely with uh, with uh, with these uh, strong uh, leaders and, and how I think how much comfort it's given Islanders. So just to uh, also, uh, I think on days like this, uh, uh, my wife, uh, Jana, who is a tireless worker, a small business owner, an operator, and uh, I've never seen anyone work so hard, <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, uh, many times uh, she gets uh, people uh, uh, inaccurately refer to her as my wife, and uh, she is certainly my wife, but she is uh, someone who, uh, who uh, looks after herself, and she's a leader, and she inspires so many, and so I'm grateful to her on this day. And my daughter, Camden, who's in grade 12, uh, is a great role model there. And so just to all of the great women uh, leaders in our province through our public service and to all those uh, women and girls, uh, just uh, let's uh, enjoy this day and let's make every day uh, International Women's Day, Mr. Speaker. Um, a lot of heavy news uh, lately, Mr. Speaker, but it was certainly nice to see uh, uh, Mark Arends win a gold medal today and uh, uh, Beijing's second medal. Uh, uh, I was actually skiing at Mark Arends Park on, on uh, Saturday, and I was thinking as I was uh, drafting some notes here that I don't know if I've ever had the privilege to meet Mark personally, but I feel like I've known him. Uh, his whole life, and uh, obviously his, uh, his, you know, his success as an athlete, Mr. Speaker, goes without saying, and it's on full display in Beijing right now, but uh, one of the first things I remember when I was the editor of the Island Farmer was doing a story on a two or two and a half year old boy who lost his arm in a farming accident, that boy was Mark Arends. <laughs> and uh, it's funny how these things, uh, you carry uh, these memories with you and through, but just uh, a great example of someone who uh, didn't look at the challenges, Mr. Speaker, but saw the positivity and saw the hard work and turned himself into a tremendous elite world athlete and an even better human being that all people could look up to. So congratulations to Mark on that. And just finally, Mr. Speaker, uh, I know there was uh, uh, a change in format with Music PEI and their awards, but it was nice to see Nathan Wiley uh, uh, win the Album of the Year, sponsored by Buchanan uh, Technologies uh, and the uh, SoCan uh, 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 Songwriter of the Year. The Lifetime Achievement Award, I thought, was a great, uh, uh, great recognition for Reg Bala. I think if anyone who been around the music scene in PEI, uh, I, I, and I got to know Reg only a little bit because I was friends with Carrie Wynn McLeod, and uh, he performed on the album she made, which now over 30 years ago, I think. But uh, I remember meeting Reg Bala when they were when they were uh, taping that, uh, and uh, what a cool guy he was. He looks like he hasn't changed one bit, uh, still active, and it's just it's people like Reg Bala who have kept the industry uh, strong here in Prince Edward Island. So just congratulations to Music PEI and to Reg for that recognition so well deserved. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too would like to welcome everybody back to the Legislature for another week, and those who are joining us in the gallery and those who are watching at home. I, and I'm just going to pick up on uh, the Premier's reference to Reg. Uh, I, I've known Reg for a very long time, and he's just the most wonderful feller, a fantastic musician and also a fantastic human being. And he, he keeps time almost as well as you keep time, Mr. Speaker. That's, uh, he's a fantastic drummer, and I played jazz with him, I played blues with him, I've done rock with him, and he's just a, a fabulous guy. And 
he just exudes positivity everywhere he goes and uh, he's, he's lovely and very well deserving of that Lifetime Achievement Award and of course all of the other award winners at the Music PEI conference last week, which was, as the Premier also said, unfortunately curtailed by, by events that are happening here. Um, Reg uh, lives in District 17 and um, as does, or as did, um, a pillar of the community in Bonshaw, Blaine McPhee, passed away a few days ago and Blaine was uh, you know, when you think of pillars, you think of large, strong structures. Blaine was not. He was a very small, diminutive little guy. But uh, he occupied a very important place in the community in all kinds of ways. Um, he was a firefighter with the Crapo Fire Department, Department for nine years. But he did so much more than that. And uh, on this day, I, I, my thoughts go out to his family, to Annie, his wife, and, and to his kids, Noel and Tiffany and Brad and uh, for a life well lived. He, he was a dearly loved man uh, within the fire fighting community and, and beyond. Another, another resident of District 17, Oleg Babeshko. Um, he's so happy, he's Ukrainian, and he's so delighted to be reunited with his family who arrived on PEI just last week. And of course, they're fleeing the war in Ukraine. You know, we've all watched those pictures and heard those stories of Ukrainians uh, who are sheltering in uh, metro stations, who are making their way perilously across their country and then Europe, and in this case, across the Atlantic Ocean to be reunited with their families. And Oleg himself has been living here on Prince Edward Island since 2017. He's a resident of Rice Point. But his mother and his stepfather and his mother-in-law all arrived on PEI um, after taking shelter underground in Kyiv. Um, a couple of weeks ago, and eventually, after a long and perilous journey, the, and with many, many volunteers to help them along the way, their family was reunited. So uh, it's just a, you know, to think that those who have lived through what 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 is can, and continues to be a dreadful situation in Ukraine are now here, living on Prince Edward Island in our community with us, and I know that all around the world, people are opening their arms to Ukrainians who are fleeing a, a desperate situation. And uh, to Oleg Babeshko and his family, uh, welcome to PEI, to Canada. And uh, I, I hope you find peace and comfort here. And it uh, must be very difficult because, of course, all of their friends are still um, facing what's happening over there. And finally, to Mark Arends, uh, I, I did have the pleasure of knowing Mark, or I do have the pleasure of knowing Mark, and I, uh, I remember Mark, he went to high school with my kids, and he was a, he was a ref uh, for soccer games, and he was a fair ref, but you would never describe his athletic skills as just fair. <laughs> He's an extraordinary athlete, um, and I think I spoke last week about the Hall of Medals uh, he took back in 2016 the most ever by a para, Paralympian at Winter Olympics for Canada, six medals. He now has 10 medals, including the gold that he won today. So um, it's a real pleasure to know Mark and to know that the prowess that he shows athletically is also reflected in the kind of person he is. Very, very fine gentleman. And uh, I've, I feel honored to know him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's nice to be back again. I want to welcome everyone back and say hello to everyone from Evangeline Muskush and across the province. Also, I'd like to congratulate Mark Renz on his gold medal win. Quite an accomplishment. Congratulations to Mark. Mr. Speaker, on Saturday night, a fire caused significant damage to Waddell's Fish Mart in Summerside. I'd like to extend our thoughts out to the Waddell family. Waddell's is a top-notch seafood business with excellent products and services, and we wish them a speedy return to business. Mr. Speaker, also today, as was mentioned earlier, as my colleagues have said, in Prince Edward Island and around the world, we're celebrating International Women's Day. This day celebrates all the women and girls who inspire us by demonstrating leadership in, their cho in the choices they make in their day-to-day -day lives to contribute to the social, economic, cultural, and political e environments. In PEI, unlike in many places around the world, women are free to study, be leaders in the field they choose, care and provide for their families, express who they are, and fight for what they believe in. 
As we mark this International Women's Day, there's never been a more important time to continue fighting for gender justice, for fair and livable wages, for freedom from violence, for access to affordable housing and childcare, for leadership, and for the opportunities to thrive. I am thankful for the women in my life, and I thank my wife, Linda, who's a very hard worker, and she helps my two sons in their business, and she's a leader in our community. And to those women who have inspired others to break down barriers and achieve their dreams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, the Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure to rise today. I want to say hello to all the folks watching uh, from District 9, and, and thanks to those joining us in the gallery and, of course, to the media. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today is International Women's Day, certainly a day to celebrate women and girls across Prince Edward Island and across the world, and, and certainly a day to, or to raise awareness of the progress made towards achieving gender equality. Mr. Speaker, there are so many people to thank and to acknowledge. Um, and, uh, and I could spend all day up here, but I'm just going to name a few if, if you'll allow me here. Uh, first and foremost, my mother. She tunes in every day, and, and I, I, there's no words to really describe how thankful I am to my mom. I also want to take a moment to, uh, to thank all the women in this legislature for their public service. Uh, thanks to each and every one of you, and, and to those before us, as I look at the, the picture of the famous five here, um, the uh, incredible women who inspire me every day. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I also want to thank my team uh, in the Interministerial Women's Secretariat. Uh, Michelle harris Ganch, who's the director, Michelle Bliss, Aaron Cusack, Don Wilson, and Jennifer Cairns Burke, Mr. Speaker. These women are working um, incredibly hard uh, to ensure uh, that a, uh, a women and gender lens is taken on our decisions within government. I just really want to take that time to, to thank and appreciate them. And also, finally, Mr. Speaker, um, thanks to all the community groups out there, the NGOs, all those individuals working so hard to uh, provide opportunities for women and girls here across Prince Edward Island. I've been taking this day to, to do a lot of reflection, and you know, I look at this last two years and, and with COVID and the disproportional impact it's had on women and, and then looking across it at, in, in the Ukraine and, and certainly we see the impact it's having on on uh, women and their children and um, I can't help but tear up when I think about it. So Mr. Speaker, although we have done so much work, um, there is still so much work to do and, and certainly as the Minister responsible for the status of women, I'm committed to that. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and hello <laughs> to my colleagues and everyone tuning in from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, and from all around the island, um, and to the, the people in the gallery and media and our pages here today, um, and happy International Women's Day. Um, there's, you know, so many women and girls who play such important roles in our communities, and they're often the reluctant leaders who step up in the face of needing to do so. Um, and so for that, you know, that's just kind of something that, that tends to be innate um, in, in women. And so thank you for all of the women who are working on our front lines. They make up the, the, mo the, the bulk of our front line work right now. Um, and also to our community partner organizations for your tireless work and advocacy. It's making a huge difference in our province. Um, a huge congratulations to the recipients of the Music PEI Awards. Um, I have many friends who are musicians, and so Music Week has always been a fun week to be involved. The last few years, not quite as much as I used to be, but I can tell you, watching it on my TV was a much different experience than I would have experienced it just a few years ago. Um, but it was still the pride that I felt in our, in our very large um, music community was was larger than, than it ever has been. So we've got that going. And I just wanted to say a really special shout out to all of the people who are working in our school system and those who are involved in it. So parents of our children, our children, our teachers, our EAs, our speech language pathologists, our counselors, I'm, I'm not gonna name them all, our school bus drivers, everybody involved in our schools. I know that this is such a high stress time and um, really, you know, we stand up here and we say thank you, but you're in my thoughts all the time. And as a parent myself, I know the stresses that our kids are feeling. And thank you for hanging in there a few more days until March break. And I hope that you have the best March break, um, relaxing and enjoying time with your family. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Mermaid, Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise. Hello to everybody watching us today and from ever to everybody from Mermaid Strafford to the gallery. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and so, I'd, first of all, I'd just like to thank the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. He, uh, yesterday morning, took the time out of his schedule to come and um, sit in and meet with the Strafford and Area Alliance Club to hear all the great work that they are doing in their community. And uh, I appreciate that. We know that um, service organizations build from the bottom up and they really are important in everything that happens in our community. So I, I do appreciate that. And this is International Women's Day. And um, the, I really appreciate, um, you know, we're talking about breaking biases within the workplace and, and where you would often see women or not see women. And it made me think about where I used to work. So my, uh, my career, where I started my adult career, um, I worked in telecommunications. And I can tell you, there's not a lot of women that work in telecommunications. And in one town hall meeting that I had with, I used to work in small business, and uh, one town hall that we had, we had all of the staff members there. And I started going through each of the teams and counting how many women were actually in each of the teams. And uh, t we represented about 21% of the workforce of that small business team. And just to put that into perspective, that's 23 women who I worked with, bright, really smart, intelligent women who really helped me build my, my career and make me stand up for what was right and work and expect, you know, really exceptional work. And I was grateful, especially with the women that worked in my direct group. Um, but when I started going back over those numbers, I recognized that only four of those 23 women actually worked in a management position. Everybody else was an assistant, um, an administrative assistant, or they worked in marketing. So it's interesting when you go through um, the different choices of careers and you see where some are heavily weighted towards men, some are heavily weighted towards women. And I want to recognize women every day that are breaking down glass ceilings to make more space for fantastic women to be able to um, move into places where they're not normally seen. And uh, you know, women every day in those in those careers that we populate do exceptional work, and it's really another level when you see them work as hard as they have to to actually break down that barrier to get into those different positions. So that's coming out of telecommunications. I know you see that in um, engineering. You see it. You can just list them, the trades, everything. And uh, so a shout out to all the women that every day are breaking down barriers to make more space for those around them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Jonathan Member from Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I just wanted to rise and and acknowledge the, the tragic fire that happened in Summerside at Woodall, Woodall's Fish Mart. It, formerly mo known as Arsenault's Fish Mart, and to many it was just Ernie O's shop over the decades. Uh, it was recently purchased by uh, John Waddell and his and Stephanie Ellis, uh, but uh, who was a longtime employee at, at, of the shop. And this this business has its stamp all over um, local sports teams and sponsorships, and it's it's just been a real, real pillar of the community for a long time. I'd, I'd also like to commend uh, Chief Ron Enman and the firefighters for working diligently to make sure that this fire wasn't any worse than it was. Um, and I know I'm not alone in saying best wishes to the new owners, and I hope we see a successful return of uh, such a long-standing business in District 22. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And welcome to listeners from uh, Charlottetown, Brighton, and of course, visitors in the gallery. Congratulations to Rich. My wife and I have uh, danced his beat seemingly for a lifetime, starting back when his hair was black. Uh, and he really <laughs> deserves uh, his recognition. So this weekend, I was in Philadelphia for a family celebration. I can bring back the good news that not only is spring well on the way and I've reached Philadelphia, but even more important, yes, there is life after COVID. Phil Philadelphia has now recovered after the latest Omicron wave and barely in anyone was wearing masks. Uh, my family celebration was about 100 people with everybody 
kissing, hugging, eating, and even uh, what I believe is still illegal here, dancing. It was great. Um, it was life as usual. So Islanders, there is hope that we will also be back to normal life here very soon on PEI, although it doesn't seem possible right now. I would also like to shout out to Ireland cartoonist Rain Wright. If you read The Guardian on a regular basis, you may have noticed that last year my name was mentioned in one of Wayne's cartoons. Hardly a laudatory mention, uh, but what do you expect from a political cartoon? Wayne was mentioning that I had only uttered 27 words in the legislature. A very sim symbolic number, of course, being exactly one word per legislature. This is, of course, the kind of exaggeration you expect in politics. So not only am I not concerned, I'm absolutely delighted to have been chosen by Wayne Wright as a target. To me, it means that I have arrived in politics. <laughs> it's not every politician that has the honor to be cartoons. So a big shout out to cartoonists uh, everywhere, uh, and Wayne in particular. Um, and I must shout extra loud, as I believe he is currently in a South Pacific island. We should all feel lucky that we here, unlike Russia and China, have political cartoonists and critical writers. Meanwhile, I'm working hard on uttering more than 27 words. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today feels a bit, a bit more difficult than I was expecting, Mr. Speaker. Normally, International Women's Day is a day when um, we're, as long, for as long as I remember, been celebrating in fellowship with, um, with other women whose mentorship and experience I really value. And, and I'm really missing them today. But I did get to spend time with one of my favorite people in the world, Flori Sanderson, this morning. And I may have posted some ridiculously adorable pictures of baby goats. Just to, to, you know, if you need a little bit of serotonin, I highly recommend bottle feeding baby goats before you have breakfast. Just <laughs> going to share that now. Um, and Flori is one of those people who, um, I, you know, I've mentored her. She's mentored me um, in what really matters. Um, and how you can make an impact no matter what challenges are up against you and that, that yes you can absolutely make a business as a woman in a space that doesn't recognize sometimes that women can and should um, and her hashtag cutest place on earth has turned into a really successful business that impacts lives and people and stories over and over I'm looking forward to being there again as often as I can but Mr. Speaker I, I wanted to just just really quickly, um, in, the, in that follow-up from some of the other comments, um, about choices. Um, and I think a lot of us in this House can speak to that, particularly the women, that, that despite and in, instead in spite of our freedoms that we have here, which are absolutely remarkable compared to what we're seeing on the news every day, not all women have the same choices. Because women are more likely to be caregivers. They're more likely to be caregivers to their children or to other members in their family or to seniors. And that means that you make different choices. And sometimes those choices that you make because you're caring for your loved ones is that you're not able to step up when you want to. It's a choice that I had to face as a single parent. It's a choice I know that others in my caucus have had to make for different reasons. And it means that it is more difficult. There is a real barrier there whether that's to start a business, because the risk when you're a small business owner and you're a woman means that you're actually deciding whether or not you're going to feed your kids with the money that you need to put into your business is different. So, Mr. Speaker, we cannot forget our privilege, but we can also not forget that these barriers are real and they're still here right now. We can't forget that it was only 50 years ago that the first woman, Jean Canfield, took her place in this assembly, and that there's only been 32 women elected since. And we're a chunk of them right here. We can't forget that it was only 100 years ago that the first MP, Agnes McPhail, was, was elected, when still most women in Canada couldn't even vote. In fact, indigenous women didn't get the vote until 1960, Mr. Speaker. And we can't forget that women still only earn, on average, 77 cents for every dollar that a man earns. It takes 15 months for a woman to earn the same amount, on average, as it takes a man to earn. Those gaps are wider if you're indigenous, if you're racialized, if you're a woman with disabilities. is funny. Mr. Speaker, 
it's tough to talk about these serious things on a day which is also about celebration, but this is the reason why we celebrate it. When people ask, why do we need a special day for women? This is why we need a special day for women, because we're not done yet. We have these huge gaps, and if we don't talk about them when they're serious, as well as when they're fun, then we're not going to make strides to address them, and we're not going to recognize that we have to make special space for people whose barriers are real. And Mr. Speaker, whether that's someone amazing like Flory and Baby Goats and a business that keeps her and her family thriving, or whether it's you know, a young um, BIPOC woman who's starting a skincare business and needs that initial funding from Innovation PEI, and she's going to get it because we're paying attention and we're saying, yes, I hear you, I see you. That's how we make a difference, Mr. Speaker. And I'm proud to be one of the people that makes a difference when they see us stand up in here and speak for them and say, one day I can grow up and I can do that too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable member from Shoretown, West Worthy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yeah, happy International Women's Day. It's a special day. The theme this year is break the bias. And, and I did a lot of thinking about that. And I, I just want to, I just want to, um, talk about three, very, very briefly, talk about three uh, constituents in my area um, that, that just finished up their playing careers at UPEI. And uh, they, they played their last games at, at, at UPEI, and they're, the, they're, they're women that I look up to. Carolina Del Santos was an incredible player, and, and as she gets ready for playoffs, uh, she's just an unbelievable person. Reese Baxendale came over here from Sussex and lives in the area, and and just an incredible things and and the last one you know you, t you ask about you ask often who's the best basketball player you've ever seen or some people say Michael Jordan some people say Kobe Bryant well I say uh, it's Jenna Mae Ellsworth and she's from Charlottetown and she had one of the best careers I've ever seen in my life so just want to say thank you to those three and happy International Women's Day thank you Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honor to rise today and uh, welcome everybody uh, to Legislature Day as well as everybody watching home from Kensick to Malpec. Uh, today, Mr. Speaker, is a, is a very special day. It's, uh, it's my daughter Kennedy's 14th birthday. And uh, speaking of International Women's Day, um, I often think of my daughter Kennedy for 14 years old. Uh, she's a beautiful, strong, very dependent individual, uh, good athlete, uh, has never given me any trouble in her 14 years. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't thank her enough. She certainly makes me proud to be her dad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Miss anyone? Member statement. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we have established, today is International <laughs> Women's Day. The theme this year, as mentioned, is Break the Bias. Amazing and fierce local leader and author Sarah Roach Lewis wrote a book called She Rules. Sarah believes with all her heart that gender equity is what will change the world. In her book, she says, quote, if you want to change the world, empower women to solve problems and make more money. Because when women have more money, they can share wealth with their children, their families, and their community. As I reflected on this, two more local leaders came to mind. Local singer-songwriter Kinley Dowling won the Community Contributor of the Year Award Sunday for Music PEI. Through her song microphone, she is helping change the way we talk to our youth about consent, healthy relationships, gender roles, <coughs> gender diversity. Her art is a platform to her tireless work with survivors of sexual assault. She is amplifying the voices of survivors, and they are helping to break down the walls to make the, the systemic changes needed to stop gender-based violence. Sobi, Sobia Ali Fasal is the executive director of BIPOC Usher. She has her PhD in psychology. She is using that to amplify, empower, and support racialized voices in this province. She says, quote, words determine how we view the world, end quote. Language is powerful, and she is using her power to give people visibility. She encourages us to understand that the experiences of BIPOC people are complex, and she works daily towards tearing down the oppressive systems that are full of racism and bias. We are so fortunate to have leaders like this, leading the way to a more equitable, safe, and healthy Prince Edward Island for all. When we celebrate International Women's Day, we are celebrating these leaders because we need them more than anything. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Islanders have been hit once again with the devastating prices, with, with a devastating price increase at the pumps last night. My heart goes out to all single parents, those working for less than livable wage, and those Islanders in general who are finding themselves struggling more these days to make ends meet after watching the prices of basic human necessities like oil to heat their homes and gasoline to drive to work skyrocket over the last few weeks and days, on top of the record-breaking inflation rates driving the cost of every other aspect of our daily lives up as well. Mr. Speaker, the average car has approximately 45 to 65 liter gas tank. That's not including SUVs and trucks. If you met in the middle at 55 liters, with today's gas prices, it would cost $102 for an Islander to fill their tank. Mm. That's up 66% when compared to the $1.25 per litre in March of 2021. Mr. Speaker, a 1,000 litre oil tank today costs $1,659 to fill. That's up 57% when compared to March 2021, average of 96.2 cents per litre. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure government's response to this will be that Russia and Ukraine events weren't happening in March of 2021. And while that may be, Mr. Speaker, and it may be true, that does not excuse this government for their lack of responsibility on action and tackling the overall affordability issue we are now facing in this province. A proactive and timely response to the many calls for action on the affordability issue would have softened the blow that Islanders are feeling today. Mr. Speaker, it's even more troubling to see this government and official opposition completely disregard a vote to a vote to vote down an effort by our caucus last Friday that called for immediate action by government to help all Islanders. Mr. Speaker, it's time our Premier put the storytelling days behind him and put some action behind his slogan, it's about people, because I'm not sure what people he's referring to anymore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, last week the uh, Honourable Member from Charlottetown Brighton asked uh, some questions with regards to uh, public transit and um, I'm, honoured, uh, I'm honoured to bring back this information today. It did it, uh, take a couple of days to compile it uh, due to the fact that uh, it's a multi-departmental uh, initiative, uh, not only transportation infrastructure but uh, ECA as well as the Department of Finance. So uh, Mr. Speaker, with that I'll, I'll be more than happy to table this information. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Mr. Speaker, on Friday, the member from Charlottetown West Royalty asked specific questions pertaining to the number of available emergency shelter beds for identifying males and provincially funded transitional housing units for Islanders. Mr. Speaker, the province funds Bedford and McDonald House to operate 10 emergency shelter beds and two overflow beds. Deacon House operates as an eight bed facility the province supports 10 transitional supportive housing units at Smith Lodge, along with an additional 10 units at scattered sites in the Greater Charlottetown area. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the province helps to fund Blooming House Women's Shelter to provide eight emergency shelter beds to identifying women. And this is in addition to supports offered by Anderson House and Chief uh, Mary, Ber uh, Mary Bernard's House. Mr. Speaker, I have with me shelter bed night usage for the last six months from Blooming House Bedford and McDonald House, and Deacon House that I will table today. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last week, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow asked questions with regard to PAP testing and uh, wait times. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we do have delays for results in PEI <coughs> up to five months right now for patients at average risk and two to three months for higher risk patients. Mr. Speaker, PAPs received or triaged with highest risk individuals getting their results first. Mr. Speaker, HPV testing, as I had mentioned uh, last week in my answers to the Honourable Member's questions, is more sensitive test than the pap smear and PEI will be one of the first provinces in Canada to implement its use as a primary screen for cervical cancer. Mr. Speaker, our plan is to have that available this coming fall and it is persistent, it is the persistent presence of HPV <coughs> that is responsible for causing cervical cancer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Anyone else? For our first question, I'll call on the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. COVID case numbers in our province continue to skyrocket, and that, of course, is bucking the trend everywhere else in this country. At least one in 36 islanders are infected with COVID right now, at this moment. We saw the Park Street testing site in Charlottetown close down at 9 a.m. this morning because it was at full capacity for the entire day. When asked recently about the rising case numbers, Dr. Morrison said that it is, and I quote, what we expected, end quote. Question to the Premier. If this is all, if, if this is all going according to plan and you have indeed got this outbreak under control, when do you expect the case numbers will peak? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I would have to just double check with Dr. Morrison in terms of what the, the peaking of uh, case would be in, in the projections. I think uh, what Dr. Morrison was referring to is that uh, the, 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 the prevalence of uh, Omicron and its contagious nature uh, is uh, brought more of the virus uh, to PEI and more to the to the to the country and the world. Uh, thankfully, the Omicron uh, variant is, uh, is 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 less uh, severe than what we've seen in others, Mr. Speaker. And it's double, uh, I guess, combined with the fact that we have a high uh, rate of vaccination and the implementation of the therapeutics has given us a layer of of, uh, of protection that few other jurisdictions have. I guess to the extent we have. Uh, and while we are seeing the cases, uh, Mr. Speaker, at a high <coughs> level, uh, the hospitalizations and other numbers are uh, uh, at, at, a, at a lower level. But we do watch it uh, closely, Mr. Speaker. And uh, in terms of when it would peak, I would have to clarify that with Dr. Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. John Belito, the official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Well, we, we all know that hospitalization is not the only measure of how serious COVID is, even Omicron. We know that it has potentially serious long-term impacts for every single person who contracts it. The unprecedented high case numbers we have now are starting to have a significant impact on the provincial economy. Businesses are disrupted because workers are in isolation or they're sick or they're having to go and access testing and wait in lines for four and six hours. We have hundreds of working age islanders testing positive each and every day. A question to the Premier. Do you think this disruption in the labour force, as significant as it is due to the policies that your government chose, is good or bad for the economy? The Honourable Premier. Well, I think, Mr. Speaker, that COVID overall has been bad for the economy and it's bad for the mental health of all islanders. I think we're trying to uh, uh, have tried to live with, with it and now we're trying to work our way through it and past it. I think Dr. Morrison announced today some changes in the testing components, which should take some of the pressure off uh, the testing clinics, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and although uh, we all should be mindful of a long COVID and its serious nature, Mr. Speaker, as Dr. Morrison pointed out to me uh, as late as Friday, there hasn't been enough science yet to know if Omicron is a contributor to, lo to long COVID. Uh, so that will be something we will continue to learn in the future. But I take the honourable member's point uh, that this is something that uh, once we get through to the point where we don't have any measures in place, uh, COVID will still be a worry and a concern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. Yesterday, the Premier extended the public health emergency until April the 7th which is also the estimated start date for the last phase of moving on COVID plan here on Prince Edward Island. If the public health emergency is lifted, it means that island workers will lose access to their emergency leave under the Employment Standards Act, which only operates when we have an, a, a state of emergency, health, public health emergency. To the Premier, COVID is not going away. What are you going to do to make sure that pandemic leave isn't going away either? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the state of public health emergency is something that we renew on a 30-day basis but can end at any time, as the Honourable Member knows, because we've been living in a state of public health emergency for 
almost two years now. And I think prior to us uh, being in this situation, the only state of emergency lasted two or three days at a maximum. So it's been unprecedented to, to that extent, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think what we're trying to do is, uh, uh, as we ease our way out of the state of public health emergency, uh, to try to adapt uh, to some of the realities that we have, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and in terms of, uh, of how we replace some of these programs that might uh, disappear because of we're not in a state of public health emergency is something that we're trying to work toward. And I know the Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture is working on that with colleagues across uh, the, the country as well. So uh, I think uh, we've all determined in there that uh, we need to have programs in place to help those who need them, Mr. Speaker, and that would be one that we would continue to pursue. Donovan Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. At the best of times, we have a number of friends and neighbours here on Prince Edward Island who struggle. But the reality is that so many islanders simply cannot afford to get sick right now exactly. and take time off work. Last Friday, in response to the rising cost of living challenges that are facing islanders, the Premier said he would be providing more money to social assistance clients. According to the budget table in this House, his government is on track to actually underspend on social assistance by about $3.4 million. Premier, to be absolutely clear, were you committing to greater new investments in social assistance, or were you just committing to actually spending what you've budgeted for Islanders and look like you're not going to spend? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I'd have to get a better understanding of the premise of the question from the Honourable Member. I find it hard to believe we're spending less, Mr. Speaker, uh, when in fact we just uh, committed to uh, another uh, increase uh, just uh, in, in January, I believe. Uh, and, uh, and Mr. Speaker, and what we'll be announcing later today is uh, a further uh, uh, additional uh, resources to those in social assistance. But uh, perhaps the Honourable Leader could share a little bit more about what he's uh, taking from the uh, to set up the premise of that question, and we can try our best to answer it here for sure. The Honourable Leader, the official opposition. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And yesterday, we saw yet another scheduled increase to gas prices on Prince Edward Island. And even before this increase, many islanders spent the weekend trying to figure out how their budget was going to work in this new reality. So I hope government has also spent time try trying to figure out the gaps in its own budget. Question to the Premier. In clear terms, how is your government going to support islanders who are struggling with the rising cost of gas on, on Prince Edward Island and what that is doing to their household budgets? Well, Mr. Speaker, it is, it is a great question, and it's, I'm sure it's on the minds of every islander uh, from tip to tip. What we're working on and what we will be announcing today is uh, we will have uh, over $20 million uh, uh, one-time package that we hope can help shield and cushion islanders um, from the impacts uh, of the rising cost of, of, of fuel, of, car, of gas and home heating, but also, you know, the, the challenge we face here going forward as a province is that everything that comes essentially to our province and leaves our province is done on wheels, uh, and that if the, if the price of diesel is $2 uh, a litre, Mr. Speaker, that will, will have impacts, if not today, certainly down the road on the cost of our products. So what we're going to put together today will be uh, a package, an immediate package of $20 million, which we hope can uh, shield uh, some of the cushion, Mr. Speaker, but it's, it's, uh, uh, I know uh, $20 million isn't going to uh, make everybody or anybody whole, Mr. Speaker, uh, and we're just going to try to respond to the best we can to worldwide events that are causing the cost of living, in particular price of fuel, uh, to skyrocket in these days. John Ball member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we understand that recent inflation and spike in gas prices are largely out of our province's control. What we can do is provide relief to islanders to help them weather the storm. Yesterday, the Alberta Premier, Jason Kenney, announced he would be suspending the provincial gas tax in his province. This is the wrong approach, because the vast majority of the price spike in gasoline is due to increases in the retail portion of oil costs, not the taxes. And that retail price is going to keep going up. Plus, suspending the provincial portion of the gas tax here in PEI would cost at least $25 million in lost revenue, which means essential services like health care would not be able to be fully funded. Just about anything else would be a better solution. Question for the Premier. 
Will you be following Jason Kenney's flawed model of relief, or will you offer Islanders help that doesn't hurt our essential services? Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable uh, member for the question, and, and uh, um, uh, the honourable member is exactly right. It's about twenty-six million dollars that we collect through uh, our eight point, yeah, very close to uh, eight point uh, four seven, the flat tax that we uh, charge across the board. Um, I can't speak for other jurisdictions as to why they choose to do the things they do, Mr. Speaker. That wouldn't be anything that we would pursue here. As I said, we're looking to. Uh, <laughs> thank you. We're looking to try to. <laughs> We're looking to try to provide a, uh, a rebate uh, to put pocket money into the pockets of Islanders as quickly as we can to try to say try to help cushion from this. And uh, I, I would agree with the honourable member that I don't think a failed policy initiative to try to get some short-term game is something we should be uh, pursuing at this particular time. Charlottetown Belvedere. That's really good to hear. Thank you, Premier. We do have all the policy options, though, Premier. Back in 2018, the Greens proposed to take money collected through a carbon levy and return it to Islanders as a direct payment. Right through to the 2019 election, the PCs campaigned hard against it. So you can imagine our surprise when shortly after forming government they changed their tune, but they still didn't act. Aside from being good environmental and economic policy, this policy would have been putting dollars back into Islanders' pockets with a check in the bank every four months. And because people at the lowest end of the income range burn far less carbon, Mr. Speaker, this would give more to those who need it most. Had we done that, almost every Islander would now be receiving close to $1,000 every year. $1,000, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier, you've had three years to fix the carbon tax and put money back into Islanders' pockets. Canadians in most other provinces already receive the carbon tax, even in Alberta. Why don't Islanders deserve the same? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the debate in here has always been how we rebate that money, Mr. Speaker. And big part of uh, the carbon pricing uh, plan that we're putting forward and that has been put forward, uh, at least from my perspective, is uh, first and foremost it should be designed to help islanders get to the point where they can reduce their carbon footprint. And what we've tried to invest in is, is assistance programs and rebate programs and grants and flat out 100% funding to help islanders transition from the use of that as well, Mr. Speaker. But I do take the honourable member's point uh, well. The, the new uh, plan that we will put in place and debate in this legislature will take all of the future increases uh, in the carbon plan and rebate that back to Islanders, Mr. Speaker, but we want to continue to help support those Islanders, particularly at the lower end, who need help to transition away <coughs> from home heating oil and things like that, Mr. Speaker. So we're trying to find a hybrid model, Mr. Speaker, and not just give people money to drive cars, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a missed opportunity, Premier. You have missed the opportunity to give people money who needed it the most, who couldn't take advantage of those other programs. You can do both. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it sounds like we may be hearing an announcement any day that carbon tax rebate checks will finally start for Islanders this year, but that's too late to help with the cost of living pressures right now. We need a short-term solution that will make an immediate impact. The official opposition, Mr. Speaker, is therefore calling on government to immediately provide $100 gift cards to all Islanders, no strings attached. If we can do it for tourists, we can do it for Islanders in need. Question for the Premier. You asked us for bold ideas. Let's start. Put $5 million on the table and commit to providing gift cards for Islanders right now. Well, Mr. Speaker, there's a lot. Um, and I always admire the honourable member to be able to uh, throw so many premises into a question. So I, I need to, uh, uh, I, I would think that the thousands of islanders that we've helped to convert away from home eating fuel, Mr. Speaker, uh, would not think that they haven't been helped through the carbon pricing plan, Mr. Speaker. I do admit we can do both. I think the honourable member and I both agree that we can do both, and that's what our plan will, will be, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in terms of uh, what uh, uh, the honourable member is proposing here, I think uh, I, I think it, 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 it has relevance. I think it's a good idea. I'm not opposed to it at all. Perhaps once we talk about what we're trying to do, maybe some of that might be covered in here, but certainly would not be opposed at all to trying to figure out a way to do that, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, and try to do what we can to put as much money into the pockets of Islanders as we can. So I, I'd be open to that. The member from Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Registered nurses in this province have been without a contract since March 2021. This government says they respect nurses. However, actions speak louder than words. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Are you okay with nurses working without a contract? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member for the question. Uh, our, my preference certainly would be that uh, no employee that uh, is in a unionized position at any level in any uh, business would be working without a contract. Uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I know that staff and uh, the nurses of the negotiation teams uh, are working uh, actively to come up with a new contract that is fair to the nurses, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Renee Strapper. Mr. Speaker, registered nurses currently have some of the lowest on-call pay in the country. They are paid $3.25 an hour and must commute, uh, must be able to commute within minutes whenever they are called. I recently heard from a nurse who has to pay childcare when they are on call. Mr. Speaker, they lose money every hour that they are on call. Minister, does this sound like respect to you? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank uh, the member for the question. <clears throat> Uh, these are the types of things that I'm sure that uh, the nurses union having a strong uh, a strong union a strong voice for their membership Mr. Speaker certainly will be bringing forward and uh, I'm sure as a department as a government that uh, we uh, will and are quite willing to work look at the ideas look at what is brought forward from the unions and not just the nurses union mr speaker but right across the board all unions thank you there are no provisions in the expired contract that mentions covid 19 isolation health pei has special covid leave and that gives an rn five days to isolate Mr. Speaker, if, uh, if an RN has multiple children and a spouse and they all get COVID concurrently, that five days is chewed up very quickly. And I'll tell you what the option is for them is they either take the rest of the leave with vacation or unpaid. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Is this a respectful way to treat healthcare professionals that are holding our healthcare system together? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member for being such a strong advocate, not only for nurses, but all health care workers, Mr. Speaker. And I have heard the same concerns uh, myself, honestly, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and it's not just with regard to nurses, it's with regard to health care workers right across the spectrum, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I know that, uh, that it is a, a concern, and again, these are operational matters, but uh, to take responsibility, Mr. Speaker, I have had discussions with uh, uh, ELT at Health PEI on this very matter, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The minister needs to understand that these, the, whatever the contract is, that's the bare minimum. They can go above and beyond that. It doesn't have to, they don't have to eat up all the vacation time of our healthcare professionals in order to try to keep this healthcare system together. Mr. Speaker, I've spoken to another nurse who is facing the fact that they will not have any vacation time left this year because they had to use it all for COVID leave. This is a perfect recipe for burnout. We need our nurses healthy. We need them to stay home when they're sick, and we need them to take vacation so they can rest. Question to the minister. Why is this government nickeling and diming our nurses on when and how they can use their sick time instead of supporting them in one of the most difficult times of their professional careers? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, uh, on this matter, I do. I have to agree with uh, the member and appreciate the comments that she is bringing forward. Uh, with regard to vacation time, sick leave time, uh, you know, the various other leaves that the uh, individuals, and again, uh, the honorable member refers to nurses, but I want to speak right across the whole spectrum with regard to health care workers and that we do have to, uh, to work with them that we have to provide whatever uh, that we can. Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, just to wrap up real briefly, I, as well, uh, Honourable Member, do not feel 
that if an individual at any level is often sick, that they should be having to take vacation to cover off on that. Mm -hmm. I agree with you 100%. Thank you. Summer side, we'll Mr. Speaker, government recently announced a senior secure food pilot program, and we all agree that feeding hungry seniors should be a priority. But instead of just focusing on seniors who live in Kings County, government could be working with organizations who are already doing this important work right across the province. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Doesn't it make more sense to work with Meals on Wheels since they're already great at this and they're already positioned to help seniors? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and the member across makes a great point, and that's in fact what we are, what we are doing is we're working with all the different organizations. And I've talked to my department, and they've said that they're going to engage with with exactly those organizations like Meals on Wheels, um, and start with other organizations. I think it was mentioned in Kings County. There was one that came forward. Um, so when I, I was actually talking to my department about this today, and uh, and we want to expand from just Kings County as quickly as possible. We want to provide meals across the island to seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If you want to expand quickly, you could start with Meals on Wheels because they have 10 chapters across the province and they can't believe you're not reaching out to them. Exactly. They cannot believe struggling for funding. They are already trying to come up with creative ideas like bulk buying so that they can make this work. How is it possible that you are not consulting with people who are doing this work now? You don't have to start with a pilot. Why will you not work with Meals on Wheels and help seniors right across this province? Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and the member from Summerside Wilmot, that, that makes perfect sense and, and that's what we will do and we'll work with Meals on Wheels. If we're not giving them enough money now, we'll make sure they have additional funding. We want to help them. We want them to be successful. And uh, Mr. Speaker, like I said, when I'm working with my department, this is one of the conversations we had and so that's what we're going to do. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we on this side of the house don't think a $100 gift card is much of benefit to Islanders. That's just a free tank of gas on the figures I quoted earlier. Mr. Speaker, my question today is to the Premier, but I'll frame it as a story for him since he's fond of those. A single mother of two living in rural Prince Edward Island goes to the gas station and puts $20 worth of gas in her car. She drops her children off at daycare, goes to her minimum wage job, goes back to pick up the kids from daycare, and she can't stop to pick up a few groceries because she spent her last $20 in gas. She gets home and goes in the basement to find her oil tanks just about on empty. Question to the Premier. What do you tell this islander your government is doing to help her? Mm. The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for the question, and I think it's, uh, it's probably a reality that far too many islanders uh, live with in some way, shape, or form, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I can only imagine that the increased cost in, in gas and home heating fuel is making those decisions uh, even more difficult, Mr. Speaker, and what we're trying to do is to respond as quickly as we can to help uh, to the extent that we can, Mr. Speaker, to help uh, shield the, the, this individual from uh, uh, conditions outside of her control, Mr. Speaker, and that, that's uh, what we're going to try to do and continue to do here, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to the, to the Premier as well. Plot twists a little bit, Mr. Speaker. Your mother was also told when picking up the kids at daycare they had a cough and need to be COVID tested before coming back. Mm. The mother can't afford to stay home from work, and she, and she knows now that $20 put in her tank will not last four hours at a COVID testing line to get her to, or to get her to work if she has to go to work till the next payday. Question to the Premier. Would you be able to tell this Islander that your government has taken bold action to tackle the affordability crisis facing her in this province? Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think that uh, there are many components of that that some of our uh, COVID emergency funds uh, would help her assist her, that individual with, uh, Mr. Speaker. The special leave fund, for example, uh, would be one of them. But uh, I understand uh, very much the premise of the question and where it's coming from, Mr. Speaker, and that uh, Islanders are uh, faced with a higher cost of living here, Mr. Speaker, uh, due to factors outside of their control, whether it's a war in Ukraine or two years of a pandemic or many different other things, Mr. Speaker, uh, those things have compounded and it's uh, our job to try to do what we can to help all of those families like that to get through, Mr. Speaker. 
Do I believe the third party or second supplementary? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a true story, and if the Premier thinks it's a one-off, he's sadly mistaken. Islanders needed help last week, and they need even more help now. Our caucus called on this House last Friday via our emergency motion for government to take bold, immediate action for relief for Islanders, and the Premier challenged us to come up with any ideas. Well, that was an idea. And it's unfortunate that he doesn't think his Conservative counterpart did a very good thing out in Alberta. We're not asking to uh, give up $26 million. We're asking for immediate relief, temporarily, short term, whatever, as an idea to help Islanders. Yeah. Question to the Premier. What, why did it take you so long to act on this crisis Islanders are facing? And what is the plan you were hinting at? And is it only the best idea because it's yours? Oh, the Honorable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, there's few people in this legislature that I respect more than the leader of the third party, and why he'd be reading these questions from somebody else is really bothersome to me, because I know he doesn't believe one second of it, Mr. Speaker. I know he came in here uh, with a rushed-in piece of document that was full of errors, and they made him read it. I'm sorry they did, but, Mr. Speaker, it was a bad idea. I appreciate the idea, Mr. Speaker, but it was a bad idea, and that's why we didn't implement it, Mr. Speaker. What we're trying to do, well, says everybody, you're not a allowed to do it, for starters. So all the numbers in it were wrong, Mr. Speaker. Why would we take that idea and put it in? And I'm sorry for my honourable colleague, who was one of the most esteemed people who've ever served in here, that somebody made him read it, Mr. me read it, Mr. Speaker. But I'm telling you, we're trying to do the best we can. I'm not thinking that that's a one-off, Mr. Speaker. That story is probably more consistent across the board than, than, than people would even care to want to know, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we're trying to come up with a plan. And it's not a secret plan, Mr. Speaker. The rules of the legislature make an announcement from government take place within the legislature, and the first opportunity to do that is in ministerial statements, Mr. Speaker, and I promise you I'm bursting at the seams to share it, Mr. Speaker. It's not a secret. President of fuel prices we are now experiencing uh, has left Islanders trying to figure out how to make their household budgets get to the end of the month. Yet governments are reaping unexpected revenues on the backs of hard-working rural Islanders. During the, the COVID pandemic in 2020, over 214 million litres of gasoline was sold in PEI. Question to the Premier. How much additional revenue will this province take in uh, uh, for the, each month that these prices stay where they're at? Well, Mr. Speaker, it shocks me that three members of that caucus would be in cabinet and they don't understand how gas is taxed here in Prince Edward Island, but maybe it tells us a lot about how we've gotten here. There's an 8.47 cent tax from the province, Mr. Speaker, that's flat, whether fuel is a dollar a litre or four dollars a litre, Mr. Speaker. $26 million is the answer, Mr. Speaker. That's a fair chunk of change, all right. Uh, the province today, uh, actually, would be taking about 31 cents a litre on uh, uh, gas on the combined taxes of a litre of gas, plus their plan on increasing the carbon tax in a few weeks. Premier wants to increase the amount of EI it takes to get to, uh, to draw on employment insurance in rural pro uh, ends of the province, Mr. Speaker. Question to the Premier. With no access to public transportation in rural PEI, what will you do specifically to assist rural islanders who pay a proportionately higher amount of gas tax as part of their household income than islanders do in uh, Cornwall and Stratford, Mr. Speaker? Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure why this honourable member thinks he wants to drive a wedge between me and rural Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker, when rural Prince Edward Island is through every fibre of my being, Mr. Speaker. When he would have said, if he would have had the courage, Mr. Speaker, to just once to his former colleague who sat in this chair, Mr. Speaker, to ask those questions, maybe he could have got some solid answers, Mr. Speaker. But he can't drive a wedge between me and rural Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker, because it's all I've ever known, Mr. Speaker. You're not the only one from rural Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. Trying to do is answer the best we can, Mr. Speaker. He talks about $26 million we collect across the board. We're going to rebate 20 in a one time payment here, Mr. Speaker. 20. He wanted us to rebate 700000 with his failed gas tax freeze, Mr. Speaker. They don't have any idea what they're talking about over there. He seems to be getting a little worked up over there, Mr. Speaker, on, on this windfall of 31 cents a litre he's bringing in here, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, when I parked my 2012 GMC train in the legislative parking lot, I was beside a number of half-ton trucks. Kind of reminded me of the Dutton family parking lot at Yellowstone Ranch, Mr. Speaker. 
<laughs> many of which are driven by ministers of this government and the government. I guess they all have a handy gas card, so it's not so difficult for them. Uh, governments need to be setting an example, Mr. Speaker, to Islanders in these soaring gas prices. Mm. Question to the Premier. How many half-ton trucks make up your minister's fleet of vehicles, and why are they necessary? Finally, something we can agree on, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Finally. Uh, this is, that is a great question, Mr. Speaker, and my colleagues can attest that this is something that I ask about on a very regular basis, Mr. Speaker. And you know what? You're exactly right. Uh, we have a government policy that over the next 10 years will phase these things out, but I think we need to go faster. And I've talked to my Cabinet colleagues about how we need to immediately go to at least a hybrid vehicle as quickly as we can, Mr. Speaker. And that'll be, there'll be no new vehicles purchased uh, for government driving, Mr. Speaker, unless they're a hybrid or electric, Mr. Speaker. So there. <laughs> Five the Honourable Member from <laughs> Cornwall Middlebank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, access PEI performs an important function in allowing Islanders to, to access government programs and services in local communities. I understand for the most recently completed fiscal year that about 147,000 Islanders util utilize an access PEI location, with more than 40% of that volume tied to the location on Riverside Drive. Question to the Minister of Transportation. Are you comfortable with the level of service at the province's busiest access PEI location? Hmm. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. Thank you very much for this uh, very timely question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, no, I'm not satisfied with the current level of service that's being provided, uh, particularly uh, from our, our access PEI site here in Charlottetown. I am particularly proud of the staff that work there and, and the tremendous work they, they do. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, uh, right now within our, our department, we're looking internally of, of how we can expand the service, how we can improve the service, and uh, provide a much better service to Islanders overall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> the population of the capital region continues to grow, with recent figures suggesting that about 60,000 Islanders now live in either Cornwall, Stratford, or Charlottetown. My home community of Cornwall was the 14th fastest growing community in Canada, according to the latest census. This growth is understandably uh, contributing to significant service bottlenecks at the Access PEI location in, in, in uh, Charlottetown. Um, if the service area was split in half with a second location on the western side of the greater Charlottetown area, it would lighten the load on the eastern side of the capital re region, helping everyone. Would you agree with that statement? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, yes, we, we currently have um, a bit of uh, disparity with, uh, with access to access PEI sites across PEI. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, we are currently uh, making investments in uh, service PEI, uh, which um, uh, includes contact PEI, where you can actually phone in and, and get a lot of the services provided. Uh, there's services available online, Mr. Speaker. But as we move forward, uh, we're certainly going to be looking at uh, access PI sites uh, here in the capital region and how best to uh, to situate them and to ensure that they're not only uh, accessible but they're also part of the uh, the uh, public transit route. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Cornwall Metal Banks for second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Cornwall residents currently drive about 20 minutes to access the location on Riverside Drive uh, from residents from West River, Bonshaw, Victoria, even farther. In fact, I recently spoke to a constituent of mine who drove 20 minutes to get there and then spent another hour and a half to physically exchange a license plate. All told, it took them be the better part of two hours for a simple transaction. Um, I think Cornwall, obviously, I'm biased, is an ideal location to help meet this need. Will you and your officials from Access PEI commit to sitting down with myself and the town of Cornwall to discuss this possibility? Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, I'll certainly commit to that. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I've already had uh, previous conversations with the CAO and, and uh, the, the Mayor of Cornwall on this exact topic, and uh, our next uh, discussions, I would be more than happy to ensure that uh, you're included in them as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last fall, this past fall, uh, we passed amendments to the Highway Traffic Act. Now, this allowed things like photo radar and red light cameras to, uh, to actually be used on island roads uh, as a tool to uh, help with speed enforcement. Question to the Minister of Transportation. Uh, could you update the House if any of these new techniques are being used on PEI? Donald Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, interesting question and uh, something that I've been very supportive of, of getting this technology in place because, as I've said here in the House many times over, one of the, one of the number one complaints that we get in, in just about every community across BEI is the excessive speeding that's taking place. And that's why we as a government uh, brought this very important legislature forward. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with regards to uh, the steps moving forward, uh, right now it's, it's with justice. To, uh, to work with the municipalities and the policing agencies to best determine how the fines will be levied and, and, and the, uh, the sharing of those, uh, those fines as well. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, while that's happening, um, we will continue to look at uh, the best applications, uh, the best process to, to roll these, uh, these measures out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I know that uh, you were very passionate about that. And uh, yes, as we both share, uh, you know, mainly an urban district uh, with uh, Stratford and uh, Winslow, um, you know, I know this is something that is, uh, it, it's uh, well known to you. Um, could maybe the minister share with us on how these devices will be moved around the provinces or will they be moved around the province and will they be accessible by uh, municipalities, cities or towns? Honorable Minister of Infrastructure, Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honorable Member. Again, thank you very much for this question. Um, that, that's part of the process that we're working through right now with, within uh, uh, transportation infrastructure is, is what type of application uh, would be best suited. Uh, we do have uh, several policing agencies here on PI. As a matter of fact, I met virtually with uh, Chief McConnell last week to talk about the, the city of Charlottetown and, and how best to, uh, to apply these, uh, these devices uh, within the city of Charlottetown and, and where they would be and, and uh, et cetera. And uh, Mr. Speaker, we've had uh, conversations as, as well with officials from the PEI uh, Federation of Municipalities. Uh, they're, they're an organization that was very supportive of this initiative right from the very start. And as we move forward, Mr. Speaker, in the development of uh, delivery of, of uh, these measures, uh, we'd be more than happy to share the information as development goes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Charlton Winslow, your second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the uh, Honourable Minister touched upon it there. And of course, I'm not naive to say that there might be some constituents in District 10 and maybe even some uh, family members that uh, have maybe spent the odd time and they wouldn't, uh, you know, maybe not have known. Uh, I'm just curious if uh, there will be an announcement when these devices are put in place. I, of course, I want Islanders to be driving the speed limit, but I'm just curious if your department will be letting Islanders know once these new devices are uh, being used on island roadways. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. Uh, that's certainly one of the things that we've already had discussions on within the department um, and, again, with, with justice. Um, uh, more than likely what will happen as, as we phase these, uh, these uh, devices into uh, our roadways is uh, we'll probably give uh, residents, uh, traveling public, a, a grace period. Um, and rather than just automatically starting to send fines out right away, um, with uh, your license plate captured and the speed you were driving or going through a red light, uh, we'll probably look at, uh, for the first initial period, sending warnings out so that people are, are uh, uh, aware. Um, and certainly when we do get to the point where we're uh, implementing these devices across the island, there will be a public campaign. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, Mr. Speaker, there's one thing that we will not be doing. We will not be putting signs up saying, Caution, you're about to come into a photo radar area. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot. Education Minister told media there were hundreds of substitutes in the system. But when I asked how many were able to actually step in today and fill in for teachers who have COVID or are close contacts, I didn't get an answer. Things do not look better this week. I'm hearing from teachers who say they already know that getting a substitute won't be an option for them and they have no idea how their school is going to make it through this week. Question to the Minister of Education. Teachers are telling me that you have a problem. I ask you again, how much wiggle room is in the system and is it enough? Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Um, so as of last week, I don't have the updated numbers, but we had 345 um, certified subs, 127 uncertified, 30 itinerant. Again, we speak about the graduates um, through the uh, UPI Bachelor of Education program and, and the Dell staff being reported, uh, redeployed. I spoke about all this um, last week. Mr. Speaker, so yesterday I was informed that there was about 150 vacancies last night. And Mr. Speaker, the, the staff at the PSB and the CSLF, they were up until midnight and beyond filling those positions. And, and by 
this morning, all those positions were filled, Mr. Speaker. So, so they're, they're, they're working hard, and I, I really, truly can't say enough about the people in, that, in these roles who are trying to fill these, these positions. Recognizing this is the most challenging time we've had as an education system. Um, we're four days away from March break. Everybody's going to need a deep breath and, uh, and some fresh air, Mr. Speaker. But we are getting through this. We haven't had to close down any schools, Mr. Speaker. And again, I just want to say thank you to all those involved. Thank you. Oh, also, one thing that was mentioned to me on the phone this morning was every sub that was called last night, the first thing they said was, yes, absolutely. I'll be there. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you where those positions are being filled from. They're being spilled with, filled with speech language pathologists and occupational therapists and <coughs> autism consultants. We are pulling people from critical roles and asking them to act as classroom subs. When you are doing this, you are pulling people who are already in high demand. You are pulling people who already have incredible workloads. And when you do this, you create an unmanageable system for people. These specialists, Minister, already have backlogs. Do you think this is fair to students who need those supports or educators? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I cannot acknowledge and say thank you enough to the people who are stepping up every day to support our students and our staff, Mr. Speaker. These are extenuating circumstances, Mr. Speaker, and it's not going to be forever. Um, I recognize that these are challenging times, and I know that people are going outside of their um, areas of responsibilities to step in to, to help support the students. And, I, I guess the alternative, and I don't know, I don't know if this is what the member wants, is for us to shut down the schools again. Is that what the member wants? Like our schools, they need to be in. Our kids need to be in classrooms, Mr. Speaker. The, our kids, our, I've had more parents, more parents than you can imagine, reaching out to me. More students than you can imagine reaching out to me. And and teachers as well, Mr. Speaker, staff that want to be in those classrooms. So, so we're going to continue on this train. We've got four days left again before March break, and then everybody can take a break, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Summerside, Wilmot, final question. Mr. Speaker, I don't know if the minister thinks that teachers and educational assistants like to be treated like Tetris pieces that she can just move around and shove in to fill spaces, but they don't. They don't like it. We have psychologists, Minister, who are being told to cancel their appointments with with students, cancel assessments with students to act as substitutes. The Teachers Federation warned you about this in January at the beginning of the month, and they warned you at the end of the month, and you did nothing about it. Mr. Speaker, cases are skyrocketing, and if numbers keep skyrocketing like this, the minister is going to run out of people to move around. Mm -hmm. Question to the same minister. Part of valuing teachers and EAs means listening to yeah. them. Will you talk to school staff? about what living through your contingency plan is like in real life. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I did nothing about this. That's, that statement is just absolutely absurd, Mr. Speaker. I have worked 24 hours a day for the last couple of months to make sure that these schools continued so our kids could be in the classroom, so our staff could be in the classroom. Mr. Speaker, I would love for her to sit in my seat for one day, one day. to understand day. the challenges associated with this position and the various needs of all of our stakeholders, yes, Mr. Speaker. The, the TF has a role. Everyone has a role to play in this. They vo voiced their concerns, but the amount of people who have come forward to me and said, and said, you know, Minister, it's not perfect, but it's working, and our kids are being educated, and they're they're with their classmates, Mr. Speaker. They're in safe spaces. Some of them are away from family violence and situations, Mr. Speaker. So I am going to continue to work 24 hours a day to ensure this thing is hey, 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 hey. Thank you very much. End of question period. Statements by ministers. The Honorable Premier. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, over the last few days, uh, we have seen uh, and talked about it at length in here the last few days, uh, uh, the volatility when it comes to gas, diesel and home heating oil uh, because of the global impacts and the unnecessary and unwarranted invasion of, of Ukraine. 
Uh, and while I would love to be standing here today and to say these impacts will only be short term, uh, there are far so many unknowns, Mr. Speaker, far too many variables and far too many factors to predict where this is going. Uh, last week, uh, as has been pointed out in here, I stood in the House and committed to Islanders that we would take efforts to do what we can to assist them through this difficult time. Over the last number of days, our provincial cabinet and senior officials within government have been working around the clock uh, to develop a support package to help Islanders uh, during these challenging times. And today, uh, we are announcing a support package of only $20 million to try to help cushion some of the impacts related to the increased cost of living for Islanders. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this will provide direct uh, supports to organizations and programs that are already existing to ensure that we support uh, vulnerable islanders uh, and support those who are most impacted immediately. And these will include a one-time social assistance payment of $150 per, per client, totaling an investment of over a million dollars uh, in support of low-income islanders. Uh, $500,000 will be immediately allocated to NGOs uh, that require uh, further support for their own fuel or transportation costs and also to help pass on uh, some finances and assistance to those they serve. Uh, we are working with the Salvation Army Fuel Program, Mr. Speaker. We will increase the cap by $200 to $1,000, and we will also increase the income threshold to make more Islanders eligible uh, for this program. This investment will total upwards of $3 million, Mr. Speaker. And in addition to that, because we know the Salvation Army is having some challenges with, uh, uh, with staffing, uh, etc., Social Development has agreed to uh, assist uh, with uh, that group uh, to support with the development and delivery of this program, Mr. Speaker. Uh, through social development and housing, we will also be increasing the threshold for all senior independence programs by $200 to provide uh, support for Islanders who are living at home. <coughs> Working with our transit partners, we will immediately subsidize monthly transit costs down to $20 a month per month for adults, $10 for students and seniors. We will also be expediting the free transit for uh, under 18 to start uh, immediately, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the price of fuel, food has also been impacted, as we know, so we'll be providing $250,000 to island food banks. We will be providing $50,000 to student unions to purchase gift cards for food and gas and other items uh, to be distributed by post-secondary students and the student unions. Uh, we will also be allocating an additional $150,000 to the Basic Needs Fund through the, social through the Department of Social Development and Housing. Uh, for anyone, and I mean anyone, Mr. Speaker, who needs help and reaches out through 211 and cannot qualify for existing programs, they will be referred to these programs and they will be get the, uh, to help, and help get the support that they need. Uh, in addition, Mr. Speaker, $15 million will be allocated towards a direct rebate to Islanders. Over the last number of days, our government has been working closely with CRA and our federal government uh, to determine the most efficient way to distribute uh, these funds. Islanders earning up to $35,000 and have filed their income tax will receive a one-time payment of $150. Islanders earning between $35,000 and $50,000 will receive $100 one-time payment, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is per individual, not per household, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and, uh, and it's to maximize who we can reach with this one-time payment. Uh, anybody on social assistance who collects $150 through the one-time payment, Mr. Speaker, and also files income tax will be eligible for both, Mr. Speaker. Through this, we feel we're able to reach over 90,000 Islanders uh, with this direct rebate to help offset uh, the cost of living. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we know this isn't perfect. We know this is an initial step, and we know there will be uh, uh, areas that we'll have to focus on in the days ahead, and we're committed to doing that, Mr. Speaker. I have asked each department and their officials to work as fast as possible to implement the components of this plan with the intent to get money into the hands of Islanders as soon as possible. And, Mr. Speaker, I just want to remind everybody out there uh, that if they're in need of the best and easiest way uh, to access help, it's by picking up the phone and dialing that 211 number. Our dedicated team at 211 will be there to answer the call, help connect you with the programs and services, and to try to do everything we can to make sure you get that help as soon as possible. I would also say, Mr. Speaker, that it's been said in here time and again uh, that we live in unprecedented times. Uh, for the past two years, Islanders have been hit hard by a worldwide pandemic. It has impacted us all. It has changed us all. And uh, now, just as we seem to be getting through to the end of that, uh, war is being raged on a free and sovereign country, and that is adding further volatility and uncertainty to the world's economy. Um, and while I know these collective impacts hit Islanders 
hard. They hit families hard from tip to tip. I know it hurts, and I know the worry it causes. Uh, we understand that, and we're trying as hard as we can to do what we can to limit the impacts. But it's also important that we pause and not forget why this is happening. Free citizens of a democratic society are being forced to leave their homes, separate from their families. They're being killed. The needless, heartless aggression of a dictator has turned the world upside down, Mr. Speaker, and the efforts by those uh, to help stem this off through worldwide sanctions and other immediate measures uh, aimed to stop that dictator have brought uncertainty to the world's economy, and we're feeling the impacts of that here. And there has never been a more important time for us to work together, to stick together, and for goodness, fairness, and kindness to win out over the alternatives, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Leader to official opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you so much, Premier, uh, for this $20 million support package. This was needed, and it's welcome, and Islanders, thank you. There's a lot of information in there, and of course it will take a little while to absorb all of that, but I, I, like, the, I like the wide reach of the programs that I heard from social assistance through transit through helping seniors, uh, through money to NGOs. Um, and then, of course, the bulk, what I heard at the end was $15 million out of this $20 million will end up as a direct rebate mm -hmm. to Islanders. And you're trying to figure out how best to do that. Three years ago, we could have told you exactly how to do that with a fee and dividend system associated with the carbon tax. Because as my honorable colleague mentioned during question period today, um, there are mechanisms in order to rebate money directly to Islanders. And uh, I just wish that, as I stand here today, this government had taken the opportunity to do that three years ago, implement a program that today would have put over $1,000 in every Islander's pocket as a result of that. But let's, let's not be too harsh here. Uh, this happened quickly. It happened as a, re as a result of an emergency. It happened as a result of things way beyond the control, not just of a provincial government, but of our federal government too. These are geopolitical events. Um, and as the Premier finished his statement, uh, that are you know, not only troubling from an economic point of view, but uh, desperately difficult from a humanitarian point of view as well. And I, I opened my uh, greetings today with a story of a family that's, that's recently arrived in District 17. So we're all fully aware of that. I'm really, really, really happy that you did not um, go along with the su suggestion um, of getting rid of the uh, excise tax, the, the provincial portion of that on, on gasoline. When you use Jason Kenney as your model for policy, um, and I suspect that you probably maybe need to look elsewhere. Because <laughs> um, I think only in Alberta, and perhaps my friends to the right, who perhaps are to the right of Alberta, yeah. would, uh, would suggest that that is good policy. It's terrible policy. Yeah. This is a good idea, putting money directly in the pockets of islanders. $26 million in lost revenue with no direction of where it's going versus $20 million where you can direct it to those who need it most. Yeah. One thing I, wanted, I do want to say is that I've watched this government deal well with crisis, whether that is COVID uh, or whether it's the potato war crisis, crisis or <laughs> there's a lot of them around, <laughs> or whether it's what's happening now. But what I do not see from this government is the ability or the acknowledgement or the understanding of how to lay a foundation for a provincial economy which will cushion us to a certain extent from all of the buffeting that is inevitable. I mean, those are just three examples that have happened in the last couple of years, but they're not going to go away. There will be other crises that, that come up. And I would love to see a government that starts to plan and put in place policies for long-term solutions to create the foundation for a regional and uh, for, I'm sorry for a provincial economy here so that islanders don't have to so that it's, it's easier to govern it's much easier to govern when you have a solid foundation in place and we just have not seen that as yet from this government and that's that's the one failure but again I'll, i'm going to go circle right back to what i said at the beginning this was needed 
It is welcome, and I'll just thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. It's really great to see these initiatives being announced today. You know, the Premier mentioned 90,000 Islanders. Well, I'd like to remind him there's 160,000 Islanders that live on PEI, so I hope the other 70,000 are looked after as well. You know, I will say, you know, like our caucus commends them and any programs to help Islanders we certainly support. I mentioned in my statement this afternoon how my heart goes out to Islanders feeling the added pressure of the times we find ourselves in with the cost, high cost of living here on PEI. We know low and fixed income islanders are struggling disproportionately during these times. It's concerning to also hear about islanders that wouldn't have considered themselves low income as little as three months ago, but are now identifying within that population as their hard earned dollars are becoming more stretched day by day. And I'll give an example, you know, they talked about a pilot uh, food program for seniors. Well, implement it now, continue it, strengthen it. As I mentioned, while announcements such as this are from, this one from the Premier is celebrated and welcome, I'm sure most Islanders will certainly appreciate it. I look forward to the day that we see government move from a reactive approach to situations like these to a more proactive approach, so Islanders don't need to get to the worst-case scenario before they see action from this government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So today is International Women's Day. Globally recognized, this day is set aside to celebrate women and girls. It's also a time to raise awareness of the progress made towards achieving gender equality and the work still to be done. I truly believe that now is the time to recognize the full potential of women and girls in our society. Now is the time for equality and opportunity, respect and equal representation to end violence here at home and around the world. Women and girls are calling out the abusive behavior and discriminatory attitudes they face. Now is the time for lasting change, Mr. Speaker. As a government, we are investing in women, young and old. We are supporting community groups and NGOs, working towards providing more opportunities for island women. Today, I'm pleased to announce just a few of the organizations that we are engaging with to support women and girls in leadership roles, increase their participation in fields like science, technology, engineering and math, and engage boys and, girl and men in gender-based violence prevention. Here are the IWS grant recipients for this year. The Aboriginal Women's Association, who will be doing a series of workshops to help address family violence. The Faculty of Sustainable Design Engineering at UPEI, a project focused on developing leadership and promoting mentorship and role modeling. The Women's Network PEI are doing a project to help remove barriers for younger girls and non-binary youth in their areas of non-traditional employment. Action Femme, we are supporting the project's Valorisant nos talents. This project will honor and value women's talents through French language networking and learning opportunities. The Coalition for Women in Government are working to document the Women Trailblazers' history to mark the 100th anniversary of gender being removed as a barrier to voting in Prince Edward Island elections. PEI Business Women's Association are doing a project to assist in women-owned business growth, expand operations, and enhance for future success. STEAM PEI will provide after-school programming for girls in grade 5 to 6 with a focus on science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Sierra Club of PEI are doing a PEI Wild Child program to provide leadership development opportunities to girls and gender minority youth. Adventure Group will be providing experiences for youth to enhance their knowledge on healthy relationships, leadership, empathy, skill development, inclusion, kindness, and gender equality and gender-based violence. East Prince Women's Information Center will be doing a Girls Exploring Trades and Technology Camp, providing young women and girls with a safe, supportive environment to explore the tools, equipment, and skills needed for a trade or technology career. And finally, Mr. Speaker, Skills uh, Canada PEI will be doing a project to offer experiential learning, mentorship, and essential skills development to diverse communities and young women. Mr. Speaker, I, we are so proud to be funding these projects that will be supporting women and girls all across our province. And again, Mr. Speaker, happy International Women's Day to all. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And that list of, um, of organizations and projects is impressive as it is every single year. Um, you know, 
as we consider why do we celebrate International Women's Day? It's rooted in fighting for equality, and that's why we continue to fight it. So yes, it's, it's a celebration, and it's lifting women up, and it's continuing the fight. Um, and so on that, on that note, I would like to thank the organizations for coming forward and doing the tireless work that they do every single day. Um, and that, you know, they're doing what they know to be important. And they're also going above and beyond having to fill out project-based grants. So I'm going to take this opportunity once again to talk about the funding model, which I do every single International Women's Day mm -hmm. in hopes that maybe someone will listen this time. Um, you know, they, they go above and beyond. They have their programming. They know what's important. They've got great ideas. They have the finger on the pulse of, of what we need. And yet we make them jump through hoops and design special projects to suit what we think the priorities are. And that's just backwards and it's just not right. Um, you know, if we, if we could let them pick their priorities and focus on their priorities, we would be even further ahead than, than they've brought us already. And so on that note, I, I just like to think, you know, imagining the difference that would be made if bureaucracy kind of gave them that operational funding and said, do what you do best, we trust you. And that's what that funding would say. So on that note, happy International Women's Day. Thank you to these organizations who are doing tireless work day in, day out. You know what our community needs, and you're stepping up to fill that, thank you, despite the extra work that we make you do all the time. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party, House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise to speak on uh, about the, uh, this announcement and International Women's Day, it's it's important, especially. And I do, I, I think, from last year, um, it seems that maybe the amount of organizations is up a little bit. So I want to focus on that, and I think it's wonderful that that more organizations are getting funding today, and that's that's really what the important thing is here. So the Aboriginal Association uh, Sustainable Design was was a very neat announcement. Women's Network, congratulations, Action Farm. Coalition of Women in Government, PEI Business Association, STEAM PEI, the Sierra Club, Adventure Group, East Prince Info Center, and Skill PEI. Um, just wanted to kind of say those to, to just know where that was going and, and the good work they're doing and, and say, yes, there is a lot of work to do, um, but I'm, I'm really optimistic today, and, and, and especially, too, for, for the BIPOC groups that we talked about. Um, I talk with them often, Black Culture Society and BIPOC Usher, and I follow their lead, and I, I, I thank, thank goodness they're there because they are the right people for that job, for PEI, and this is a great announcement. Thanks, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of Minister Statements. Presentation, presenting and receiving petitions. Tailing of documents. The Honorable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, uh, by leave of the House, I beg uh, leave the table. Uh, the uh, response to uh, oral questions last week from the Honourable Member from uh, Charlottetown Brighton, and I move, seconded by the uh, Minister of Health and Wellness, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness and the third party whip. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I beg to leave to table a, a document on petroleum pricing and liters sold uh, from Iraq and their annual reports 2019 2020 and 2020 21. And I move second by the member from Tignish Palmer Road that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? Carry. Anyone else I miss? The reports by committees. Introduction of government bills. Government motions, orders of the day, government. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that the first order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure that this House do now resolve itself into committee, the whole House, to take into consideration grant of supply to Her Majesty. Shall I carry? The Honourable Member from Tignesh Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please.
whole house to consider the grant of supply to Her Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Yeah. Members, we uh, left off on page 104, the Department of Fisheries and Communities. The section of municipal affairs has been read and is currently being debated. Please state your name and position for Hansard. Mary Kinsman, Director of Finance and Corporate Services for the Department of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, we left off uh, again, page 104, Municipal Affairs. It has been read. I'm going to continue on with my list. If you choose not to be on it, you can uh, let me know. Uh, Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Okay. And when we left the last time, we were talking about Municipal Affairs and we were talking about annexation, amalgamation, all of the A's. <laughs> and um, so, and what's interesting is, you know, amalgamation is a very um, delicate place for um, us to be. Um, and we've had a conversation a lot because where we had left off was, if you're in, in, in an unincorporated community, you can just knock on the doors and see if the people want to join. But the challenge is, is you're the person right on the line of that incorporated community might want to, then you might have five that don't, and then you have one that does. And what we were talking about the last time, just for, you know, just to kind of bring us back to where we were, what we were talking about the last time is, is there's nobody to facilitate that. And that conversation, as I said, you know, when you have council members who by and large are acclimation in some of those small communities who have full-time work or maybe they're retired, they just, that the ability to go and do that facilitation isn't necessarily there. And so because we are in a situation where the, the act is making us take steps, progressive steps to a, the end of a five-year plan, <coughs> but if you don't accomplish what the act is calling for us to accomplish at the end of the five-year plan, where does that leave those small communities that are surrounded by unincorporated communities that makes it difficult for them to make those connections and, and facilitate those conversations? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you, ra you raise a good point, member. Um, you know, but we, we have, we have a, a great base of community leaders out there that that um, are talking about the future and their vision and where they want to see them be and and uh, you know they it's a, I call it a grassroots led organization or or, or a, you know a group of islanders that feel passionate about their area that they live it could be in an unincorporated area or it could be in a, an incorporated area and you touched on it that you know you might have this guy wants to join this this man and woman this family but then the the, the people next door might not but I think it's very important to to uh, acknowledge them, them community leaders or people that that uh, want to start them discussions and 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 see where they go for the future. Um, you know, any government's going to be there to support them and provide them with the with the um, you know the support they need and point them in the right direction and possibly you know provide them some government or some guidance. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm the type of individual that never turns down a meeting with somebody or try to give them a little bit of insight on what I think or what I see or, or what supports are available. And I think we need to continue on that path and, 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 and help them and guide them as we, as we can. And that's my stance and that's what I hope to do. Mm. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And, and this really plays a part in, you know, we have a planning act that hasn't been updated in decades. Yeah. And we have islanders that are moving to unincorporated communities. So, I would, while I would agree, if we were talking 20 years ago, 30 years ago, those real community leaders in those communities would be there. But by and large, you know, they're not. We've got a lot of people moving into different areas, or we've got communities that have grown exponentially, um, and no thought to planning around that, yeah. right? And that's a big challenge because now you've got all these new residents that have come in and recognizing that, you know, they're, they're budgeting towards what their property taxes are. If you incorporate, yeah. it's going to be a huge impact to them. Yeah. Um, and we've allowed this to happen straight across the province because we haven't had the political will to update the Planning Act and still apparently don't. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm happy to hear that you're talking about moving the planning, the, the Department of Land and the Planning <coughs> Department or municipal, municipal Affairs back together, because I think that's really important. That I think we can all agree that that fractured a department and kind of created a divide where we didn't need to create a divide where it worked better when it was together. Mm -hmm. So I am looking forward to that happening. But I really do think that we need to start those discussions with the Planning Act right away because we are still allowing people to, you know, build wherever they want yes. in unplanned areas. And then at some point in time, like Nova Scotia's going through it, we're, you know, New Brunswick's going through it, everybody's going to be going through governance where amalgamations are going to happen. And eventually somebody's going to say it has to happen. And I don't see how we're planning to prepare Islanders for that by just saying it's not going to happen. Yeah. And if we don't plan for success in this, we've got a really clear example of you know, where it was extremely challenging. And I don't think that we want any other c community to have to deal with that. Yeah. There's a, still a lot of people in pain because of that. And so I urge yeah. those conversations to begin right away, but also the facilitation is, rec that we recognize facilitation's needed in un unincorporated communities because there is no person for you to reach out. You might think there was, mm. and I would say a generation ago, probably yes. But that doesn't really exist anymore. We've, we've seen our small communities blossom and grow in ways that um, it's not like original families that still live there and, you know, they're kind of the go-to people. And, like, I love the fact that communities are like that, but it's, it's changing. And we just are ignoring those changes and we're not preparing for it. So it's not really a question, but I would like to see what that plan looks like and how we can facilitate those conversations to start happening and those legislative changes within the Planning Act to support it because we're, we're not going down a clear path for Islanders and it's going to be a rude, rude awakening, I think, at some point in time. I, I appreciate that, Honourable Member. Um, you, you raised some good points. Uh, I am following what's going on in Newfoundland and Labrador and, of course, New Brunswick. Uh, I will be having conversations with them over the next two or three months with the two ministers on, on where they see themselves going. Big changes coming in New Brunswick, of course. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in that. Newfoundland is going through some of the same type of, uh, of problems that we are seeing over here, of course. Uh, you raise a good point of, as you know, as our population swells and continues to grow, you know, uh, we need good land use planning uh, going forward. Um, but I'll add in there too, you know, we, um, I'm dealing with land use planning on the water. And it's, it's something that we never really thought too much about a, a number of years ago. But, you know, we're seeing people coming in and they're buying or setting up subdivisions and, uh, on riverbanks and on waterways. And, um, you know, you, you put the aquaculture industry out there and land use of, of that area. And then who actually has the right away from the low water mark or the high water mark out. And then you talk about it, it's a whole thing, right? And it's the exact same thing with, with land. And I'm confident with the Minister of Agriculture and Lands that, um, you know, we're going through the land matters things. There's some good things in there that need to be looked at and implemented and how we do business and change. And it all comes down to good land use planning for the future. And I, I think we're, you know, we're, you're right. Um, the conversations must be had. had and uh, we must continue to engage, you know, all stakeholders, um, as we move this forward. So your points are very well taken. Yeah. Roommate Stratford? I'm good, thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carried. Total municipal affairs, 33,983,300. Shall it carry? Carried. Total Department of Fisheries and Communities, 44,094,000. Shall it carry? Carried. Employment Development Agency, page 106. Carried. <laughs> <laughs> General, appropriations provided for administration of program delivery, budget management, and payment processing. The administration, 7,500. Equipment, 2,700. Material supplies and services, 300. Salaries, 186,600. Travel and training, 6,000. Total general, 203,100. O'Leary and Vernesse? So that increase isn't the reason. 
a, a whole heck of a lot, uh, and I'm assuming you're taking into account uh, the uh, minimum wage increases that are already going to be in play. Um, I guess I, I'm just wondering if it's enough because it, I, I find that program it's a great program for yeah. Islanders that are have limited skills, and uh, uh, it's also an extremely important program for uh, nonprofit organizations. And uh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts. Do you think that's enough money to, to meet the what would potentially be growing demands? Because if I take as an example, in some cases, like uh, some of these facilities weren't even open this nonprofits last year, and let's assume that they're going to be coming in the coming months, uh, and especially like I think of rinks and things of that nature. I mean, they did hire some people, but nothing to what they normally would have, uh, just because there were so many weeks that they were shut down. Yeah, uh, good point, honorable member. Um, you know, you you've dealt with. Of course, Mr. Dean and different people like that, and these are great people that that know the industry and know what the needs are, and we're quite confident that you know this should allow us to provide what we need to in this fiscal year coming up into 2023. Um, but you know, like it is adaptable. You know, if we need to expand it as we had to do in COVID. Uh, or provide additional supports. Um, I'm pretty. I'm confident that the weeks will be there to, um, to you know, to handle the influx or what's what's actually required. But if it's if it is needed that we do need some additional supports, we don't know what the future is going to be, right? Especially with COVID and, and stuff like that. So, but um, I'm open to if I have to, I have to. Okay, honourable member, um, that's on the next section though. Your line of questioning. So we're right now we're doing the just the general that's part true. of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, um, if you have anything regarding the general, the appropriations for the this the the, the, the uh, provided for the administration of the program delivery. Uh, yeah, you are correct. And I, I'll yeah. save my questions for the next okay. session. Okay. Leader of the opposition. I mean, okay. I'm glad that you took okay. the heat card. <laughs> <laughs> Shall a section carry? Carried. Okay. Community and business projects, appropriations provided for wages of individuals hired by businesses and nonprofit organizations who work on approved projects, the majority of which are rural based. Special projects program, 3,191,500. Job creation program, 685,100. Jobs for youth program, 1,409,300. Rural job initiative, 724,000. Total community and business projects, 6,009,900. Valeria and Vernes. So I guess I'm going back to that same issue. To me, it, it, it uh, may not reflect uh, the amount of uh, demand that we may see this coming year as, uh, as uh, COVID lifts. Now, I'll just give you an example. Now, yesterday I had two people in to see me uh, uh, that uh, were impacted by the potato situation. Their, their employer is now well, going to try to sell out. They don't think they're going to put any crop in. And, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they might get on with another potato operator, but uh, most of those uh, in our area have have crew, and uh, so I just I just sort of and, and we started talking about different options. And I see you get the, the rural jobs initiative, but there's not even an increase in the rural jobs initiative uh, budget, and that might be a program because that, that's a little higher wage that the employer gets. I believe it's 75 percent of the first 15 yep. something an hour, right? And uh, it's a private sector, but if I was trying to get that person into another occupation uh, with a different employer. I, I just wonder whether that's going to be enough or if there's any options that you're going to have to, uh, to maybe deal specifically with a, a different situation. Well, thank you. I say it's the, the good thing about these programs are adaptable and we can if you know if the need is there, we, we can add more to it or if we have to go back to Treasury, then I'm prepared to do that. Um, you know, we were very fortunate in the last year that uh, the last two years uh, during COVID that um, we were we were able to pivot very quickly and put the jobs where they were needed and help support businesses, um, you know, that were required. And in some cases, we actually we did extensions because we knew there was they needed it. Um, you know, policy in some cases are we only give you one position or possibly two positions. We we were able to say, you know what, mm, we need to look at that because they're key for that area. So we look at it as a case by case basis so i'm prepared to do that this year in this budget and if i have to ask for more funds from the, you know the department of finance then i'm prepared to go to treasury on that just you know we got to make sure that the districts are covered and the island is covered as a need is looked at 
Or Larry Inverness. I'm just going to make another little point. If it, and, and like I say, most of the uh, the, the special projects uh, funding, which we call EDA, and I, mm -hmm. and I want to commend uh, your staff there, uh, Elliot Dean. Is, he, he knows, he almost knows the clients <laughs> personally, you know, yeah. and uh, knows their situation. So he's very good in that regard. But uh, but one of the comments I had was, you know, about some of these nonprofits to this, these people I had yesterday. You know, they're making 15, 16 an hour now, and, and you know, they're, they're a little worried whether they're going to get their insurable earnings. They know they're going to get maybe eight weeks uh, mm -hmm. within the spring. So when I start talking, but, but they're saying minimum wage, I have to, most of these places, there's a bit of travel involved where they're worried about gas prices going up. I, I guess I'm just trying to wonder, is there any reflection that we can have in, the, in that particular program that's... I know the goals are to try to get people their insurable earnings, but with the cost of getting to work today, the cost of just work is uh, is going to be a bit prohibitive for these people. And, and you know, I, I don't want to be uh, saying that my constituents aren't able to adapt and things, but these are people with meager means, the people with the limited skills in education. Because we, we started talking about what are some options. I thought, you know, maybe well, maybe the person could go to uh, work in a school and, uh, as a cleaner, but. They, they don't have grade 12. You know, you get what I'm saying? These are the kinds of problems that I'm running into, yeah. and uh, I just wonder if there's something that can be done to sort of at least get that hour, even if it was a, like the special money that you just talked about where you could give a $2 an hour uh, for a period of time while gas is high or something along that line. It's, it's, you've, you've raised a good point, and, and you're jogging something my memory, almost like a fuel surcharge where a transport company does for hauling of goods. And I'm prepared to go back to the staff and have a conversation on maybe we look at if we see if we can develop some kind of program that's like a fuel a fuel supplement uh, during these these specific times, so that if that person has to travel um, from point A to point B for work, then there might be some kind of fuel travel allowance that we could maybe look at as a program or something. I'm prepared to do that, Minister or Member. Oh, Larry and Vanessa? Yeah, that, that's what I'm sort of saying. And if it's a case where you can sort of reflect that, it may, maybe it's a case if they travel more than uh, 20 kilometers a day. I don't know. What, you know, there's something. Yeah. If your department could be creative, and I know you have that capability, and I, and I will say you as a minister have always been very accommodating when I ask or suggest some of these things. So, so from my perspective, uh, you know, I'm happy to approve this budget as it is, but I, I would want to have that caveat that uh, you can be flexible and that also if you did have to get a special warrant to deal with the situation, Situation. I'm fearful, I guess, is what I'm saying, is gas prices get high, minimum wage really isn't even keeping up, uh, you know, just, just things have happened so quickly, and that's the problem that I'm getting constituents telling me from yesterday. So if you can understand that and reflect yep. that, I really appreciate it, Minister. Thank you. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. So um, you've sort of alluded to this, I think, in the remarks you made already, Minister, but the, the interest in these programs went up during COVID, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, we only see last year's budget estimate and forecast, mm. but was, and, and I should have looked, I should have looked back further, but are those numbers significantly different from what they would have been, for example, in 2021 or 2019 20? Mm. Are they going up to reflect the added interest since COVID arrived? I guess is what I'm asking. Uh, are you talking about the added interest when it comes to um, cost of living and or, or minimum wage improvements? No, uh, that more people are looking to take advantage of the Jobs for Youth program, for example, or the Job Creation program in COVID, and therefore have we increased the budgets in order to accommodate as th those extra people who have come forward? I can, I can tell you that um, we did have different organizations that didn't know they could actually access these programs. And that's one thing I've always said, is I, I think we need to make sure that everybody is aware of our programs, right? And that, you know, if we can help them start up companies and then businesses get access to a program, then I'd rather see that than a giant company always get that same access every year, right? And I think you would agree with small business that it's very much needed. So to answer your question, I don't. I think I think the 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 program has adapted as the need has required, and I think that's the great thing. As the, the honourable member alluded to, it's very flexible, and we're able to handle the rough seas. I'll call it of of, of things go forward. But so I'm confident that where we're at now is is basically on track of what we what the, each year requires or was needed. It was able to handle it.
Does that answer the question, Honorable Member? Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Happy to hear that our Minister of Fisheries can navigate rough seas. I'm glad to hear that, Minister. So, <laughs> um, there's a couple of these programs I've spent every cent that was allocated to them last year, yep. and a couple didn't quite match all of their spending, a special projects program and the job creation program. So w were they undersubscribed or like, well, yes, it's that, okay. Yeah. So leading on from that, have you considered, you talked about these programs being adaptable, moving the excess funding, if I can call it that, that was unspent in those pro programs into the other ones, which I'm assuming since they spent every dollar, we could have spent that. more. And, and Mary, we want to talk about Mary yeah. We have to stay within our vote, right? So we stay with, yes, we can move money am amongst the, around the program. Those two programs that you mentioned were uh, underutilized, where the Jobs for Youth and the uh, Rural Jobs in Initiative, they were both had COVID projects attached to them too. Yeah. So although you've seen every cent spent here, there was also money spent in the Central Contingency Fund towards these programs. So they had additional funds attached to them. We didn't have to move money from the other programs. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition? Appreciate that, Mary, and I'd forgotten that there was extra funding came in okay. from the COVID contingency fund. That's my mistake. Um, the, uh, I, I know we, we look at, for example, the Jobs for Youth program, and, it's, and I want to thank the department for that program. Excellent program, utilized widely within, particularly within the rural districts, I think, but also, I mean, it's across the whole province. And I appreciate the comments that the minister made about large organizations year after year getting, you know, multiple yeah. jobs for youth when there are others who are, you know, not, not getting approved for one, even one. So I, I'm, I hope there is a reevaluation every year and we don't just simply rubber stamp the, what, what was done previously because I think the need is there um, wider than this program is able to meet. We look at it, or at least I always look at it as a, <coughs> largely a summer program because that's when the students are available. But when I look at the, for example, the Marker Ends Park, which is a seasonal operation, yes. do they access any jobs for youth positions at the ski park? I'd have to go back, honorable member, and, and check and find out. Um, I don't, I don't actually see who's getting the positions. I sign off on them, you know, the dollar value and that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't actually see that Company A got, you know, two positions or one position. I put directives out to the department that uh, I'd like to see new businesses get it. And actually, a, a policy of asset staff to look at for this year going forward is let's give first priority to new businesses, companies that are just starting up or in that startup phase. So let's make sure we look at them first because they're in tough times, right? You know that, and you know the 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 money it takes to get a business up off the ground and get it going. So let's look at them first before we look at other companies that are well established and that get it every year. You know, that's, I think we need to look at that. So, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. I'm very excited to hear that new policy minister. And I think that there are a lot of startup businesses. I can think of oh, three, four in my own district who perhaps would not even have considered applying because they would have thought it was a lost cause. So I'm going to absolutely <coughs> encourage them to reach out to the department this year um, to do that. You, you mentioned in your statement last week, I think it was on Thursday, about the, when uh, the, the wage subsidies are, because they get spent back into the economy, that they're a really great investment. Do you want to elaborate on what you mean by that? Well, I think we can, we, we can both agree that, um, you know, the wages that we, we, we put into workers or islanders and small businesses, um, they, as you know, they, they, they spend them locally. It's money right directly into the economy. It's not money leaving the province. Um, you know, of course, we, we need big business in PEI, and, and, and they, the, the jobs they do are appreciated. But um, I look at a farm, or I look at an oyster fisherman, or, or a, a small little corner convenience store, uh, my gas station, I used to have it. Um, you know, that's money that's spent locally. So if I hire you to come work for me and I'm approved for jobs for youth and you get where, you know, you're going to spend that money in the local area. You're going to spend it down to the landmark or you're going to go to the lobster barn or you're going to go into gas's place to get gas you're, or down there at Hampton at the little restaurant. And that's I think that's very important for the economy of Prince Edward Island. 
Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. And you've sort of just articulated uh, something we've talked about, I think I mentioned it in the House last week, about how money that you give to lower income islanders doesn't disappear out of our out of our provincial economy. It circulates here because it's spent here out of out of necessity. So I'm wondering when what how you the jobs for youth wages are based on minimum wage, right? Um, is there any discussion in the department about offering perhaps more than that, knowing that that's going to be spent back into the economy. Are there any concerns, other concerns, w uh, economic impacts that might have? Well, usually in the case of the uh, jobs for youth, um, you know, we, we provide 100 percent of the minimum wage, but, um, but then usually a lot of the businesses, they top them up or they might increase that wage. Um, I know at the gas station we used to do it. Um, I know, uh, I'm thinking of a gas station right now, I know he got a jobs for youth last year and he, he, he raised him up a little bit. So. Um, it, it's it's here's the here's what we're going to do 100 percent and then we you know they're allowed or I should say allowed they're they can do whatever they want to top them wages up to whatever they think the area needs and so on Leader of the opposition thanks chair a, a lot of talk today and and over the last couple of weeks about how difficult it is for many islanders to make ends meet yeah. right now and a, I think a very strong consensus from all corners of the house that Fundamentally, we need to increase wages here on Prince Edward Island to reflect the increased cost of living on Prince Edward Island. And I don't want to suggest that the Jobs for Youth program can be the tail that wags the dog to change that, but I am going to suggest that you look at the possibility of offering more okay. than minimum wage as a government setting an example uh, and an acknowledgement that minimum wage is not a living wage, it's not even close to a living wage here on Prince Edward Island. And if we can do that through a government program, you may well incentivize businesses to then start paying their staff a fair living wage as well. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm okay. good. Thank you very much. Shall the section carry? Carried. Total Employment Development Agency, 6,213,000. Shall it carry? Carried. Carried. Members, we're going to take a short recess to exchange departments. Honourable members, we are on page 24, the Department of Agriculture and Land. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? You're not so strange. <laughs> you please state your name and position for Hansard. Uh, Mary Kinsman, Director of Finance and Corporate Services for the Department of Agriculture and Land. Uh, thank you and welcome back. The Department 
of Agriculture and Land, page 24, Department Management, Corporate Services, appropriations provided for operation of the Office of the Minister and Deputy Minister and centralized administrative functions for the Department. Administration, 35,600. Equipment, 3,000. Material supplies and services, 38,700. Professional services, 15,600. Salaries, 514,300. Travel and training, 61,000. Total, co total corporate services, 668,200. Shall I carry? I mean, okay. Total department management, 668,200. Shall I carry? Agriculture resources. Agri Agriculture resources division management. Appropriations provided for management and support of the Agriculture Resource this division. Administration 14,000, equipment 4,000, material supplies and services 7,800, professional services 24,000, salaries 186,300, travel and training 44,800, grants 1,465,100. Total agriculture resources division management 1,746,300. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, uh, Welcome, Minister. Welcome back, Thank you. Mary. Thank you. Good to be here. Looking forward to having a good chat about the direction of the Agriculture and Land Department. Yeah, and me, I, I guess the too. first question I want to ask is whether or not you have a strategic plan for your department. And if so, what are the strategic priorities um, of your department for the next year and for the next five years? I guess I don't have to. Chair, do I have to wait for you? No, you can go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, we have a strategic plan. It's on uh, online. Uh, we're, you know, a heavy focus on sustainability, of course, is is part of our strategic plan. But uh, you can go through it online, and uh, we just uh, completed it this year, so it's up to date and and ready to uh, to move forward. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. That's exciting to hear, and I uh, I have not looked at that, Minister. I must admit. Can you give us a sort of uh, high level? sense of what the strategic plan is for the department over the next few years? Well, uh, I don't have it in front of me here, but uh, we talk, it's a lot about sustainability and, of course, and uh, uh, innovation technology moving towards that to make a economically prosperous and uh, uh, environmentally sustainable agricultural industry. So, and we touch on labor, all the major issues that are we're seeing in our our industry right now. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. Um, and you've used the word sustainability a, a few times already. Um, Probably you'll say quite a few more. Yeah, times, so. and I appreciate that because we, you know, if if nothing else, the last year has laid bare the the vulnerabilities of having a heavy reliance on one crop. And um, when we talk about sustainability, we're not just talking about the health of. Uh, the soil and the rivers, and, uh, and that's critical, of course, and don't get me wrong, but we're also talking about the economic sustainability of agriculture here writ large, and also the economic sustainability of individual farms and, and farmers. Um, so when you say you, you're looking towards innovation and technology to create a sustainable agricultural sector here on Prince Edward Island, uh, what, what sorts of operational what, what's the operational plan to put in place that strategy to make sure that we're we're getting what we want? Honourable Member, I'm just going to bring us. I'm trying to keep us going in, by section and line by line. Okay. But our next section will be sustainable agriculture. Okay. So if you want to keep that question, I, I will. I will think for sure. Okay. I have, I have other you questions. Can continue on, on here. Yeah. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. I appreciate that. Um, of course, the potato war crisis must have been occupying a huge amount of your of uh, your time and the capacity of the department over the last little while. So any idea how many of the staff in your department have been sort of engaged full time on that file for the last, what is it, two months, three months? Feels like a life bar. Yeah, no, it's, uh, we're, we just passed the three month uh, anniversary, uh, February 21st, so. Uh, <clears throat> Obviously, we've uh, a great focus has been on on the potato file, and uh, I'll have to say, uh, Dr. Carolyn Stanford has probably uh, put the most hours into it. Her and my deputy minister, but he is he's more he's he has all the duties. So uh, he's put uh, th those two have put an extremely amount of uh, effort as well as all our. Our, uh, our staff has to uh, to work with industry and work with CFIA and and the federal government over these past three months to uh, 
to, to see where if we can come out of this. And Linda Ramsey from from this department has, you know, championed uh, a lot of the work as well. Leader of the opposition. Uh, thanks, Chair. So uh, I'm aware of. Uh, members in your department who would have been, of course, actively engaged in this. And I'm wondering whether you brought any new people in in order to sort of keep everything else going when so many of the resources that the department would have been allocated to dealing with the potato wart situation? Uh, no, we've managed so far. Uh, I, I do know we have uh, one position uh, on a contract work, but it's to work on the potato file. And uh, I'm not sure if that's even started yet, but it's... It's, it's it's going forward, yeah. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. So, in the grant section uh, here, you're forecasting an underspend of about $400,000, and I'm wondering why those funds were not spent. That particular program, most of that is the Agri-Invest program, and um, that is... Uh, I'm sorry, let me get my notes here. Uh, it's, it's a demand-driven program. About $350,000 is underspent there. So in the Ag Invest program, that's about $1.1 million. So we were underspent by about $350,000. Um, and the rest was just miscellaneous grants. You'll find we're uh, a large grant department. We will move money around uh, our grant programs as the need arises. So. Uh, particularly you're going to see in our, uh, what we call our CAP programs, which are our big federal provincial agreement. Agri-Invest is, is one of those programs that's cost shared federally, 60-40, um, that uh, we will move money around in those programs as we forecast. We would meet on a quarterly basis and even uh, more than that, uh, taking a look at the programs to see if we have to move money around programs where there's a higher demand in one area, sure. and and COVID and and there may be many issues that will um, impact the uh, demand on programs. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. Um, just so I know, and I, I, this may not be the right section for this, but the Soil First initiative. Where would I? Uh, where would it be appropriate to ask questions on that? And if it's not here, that's fine. I'll just hold. Does that mean the soil and feed lab or? Sustainable. Probably sustainable lab. Okay, sustainable. Okay, our next section. Yep. I'm, I'm good for now, Chair. Okay. O'Leary and Vernas? Uh, Minister, uh, under professional services in that section, uh, that section was up 38,800. Was there a certain professional service you did acquire? And maybe that was who you were referring to in the potato wart situation. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, so who, uh, so who, who uh, was hired or what was the con or who was the company? Uh, it's called um, Andy Consulting Solutions. It's an individual who understands the federal system, the regulatory system, uh, and understands, uh, has a, uh, quite a background in U.S.-Canada relations to help us maneuver through the potato wart and provides advice in, on trade on, and on animal health, uh, plant health. Well, are you in and is that advice for the minister, or is it for the government, or the premier, or is it for the potato industry, uh, just, just to get some clarity? Uh, it's been a, a consultant that's been used by the department staff. Oh, Larry and Vernes. Okay. Um, was that a tendered thing, or is it just no. that person was identified as the expert by the industry? And yes. Okay. Oh, Larry and Vernes. No, I think that's fine for that section. Shall the section carry? Sure. Sustainable agriculture. Appropriations provided to assist the farm community with programs and services which support sustainable agricultural practices. Administration, 16900 Equipment, 15700 Material supplies and services, 43900 Professional services, 13200 Salaries, 1063600 $1, Travel and training, 13000 Grants, 2435100 Total sustainable agriculture, 3601400 Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. So I want to look at the ALICE program uh, funding. I know we talked about this in the last sitting, Minister, and uh, there was a sort of agreement, at least it felt to me on the floor, that we have both understood this program to be inadequately funded. Mm -hmm. I see that there's no, no increase here, and that's been true for a, over a decade now. I'm wondering whether you have any plans to increase that program particularly given the renewed emphasis on carbon sequestration and environmental services that are possible 
for the farming community to do to provide environmental services for us as a community and get paid for that. Right. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a extremely important. I know we had this in question period. Uh, this is a big part of our going forward. And uh, every, I don't, the only reason it was underspent is because everyone was approved who applied for it. Correct, Mary? If I'm, yes. Yeah, so uh, we're finding uh, an issue, and I, I, I'm not sure how we're going to solve this issue, is this work has to be done. There's a lot of interest in it, a lot of interest. And the problem is this work has to be done during the summer months when the, with the right uh, conditions to do uh, this work with uh, contractors. And it's we're having difficulty finding contractors with the suitable uh, knowledge to do this work is kind of where we're finding, uh, you know, more people would take it, take advantage of it if there was uh, that contractor doing that they could get that work done. Uh, that's where we're finding the issue. So. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. Um, carbon capture, you know, it's a, f I mean, it's been happening, happening naturally for billions of years, but the idea that we can incentivize and pay the agricultural sector for what it does, and other sectors as well, but here we're talking about agriculture, is a fairly new concept. And I attended an online seminar with uh, mainly American, I must say, um, ministers, uh, or secretaries of agriculture, and I asked the question, uh, and these are in you know, a number of states on the eastern seaboard, you know, similar to us, um, what sorts of programs they have in place, what policies they have in place to actually uh, facilitate, what mechanisms do they have to put money in the pockets of farmers who are providing environmental services by capturing carbon. And I, I was quite disappointed to hear that it's actually in its infancy, this, this idea, and that they did not have any solid programs. Now, that, again, I'm not, I'm not going to suggest there aren't any out there. I'm sure there are, and I'm sure there will be many, many more. But I'm wondering, with the net zero plan that we have, which has some pretty aggressive targets, which I fully support, by the way, like 10 to 15 percent by 2030, and then, oh, I can't remember what it is by 2040, but it's 25 percent maybe or more. Um, so we need to find some policies to put in place in order to meet those targets that are in the net zero plan. Uh, how are we doing with that? Well, that's uh, going to be a big part of our focus going forward. We want agriculture to be leaders in this, and I know you do as well. And, uh, you know, as we move towards improving our 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 way of farming, uh, we. We need to have that day where farmers are getting paid for doing, taking alternative land use and getting paid for taking susceptible land out of production. Or, uh, you know, that it's, it's, it's a good model to start as we move forward to pay farmers to sequester more <coughs> carbon. Uh, I think it's a big part of our future farmer program going forward. Uh, uh, it's a big part of our... Uh, when we were looking at our our um, community pastures, with we have 10,000 acres of grassland on this island that we don't talk about nearly enough, and uh, we need to uh, work that into our 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 new management plan as we go forward. Our strategic plan. We have a our livestock strategy that uh, I'm going to table here in the, probably in the next few weeks. That's just been completed. It's at the printers. So. It's part of our carbon capture plan too, as we we use these grasslands and uh, and uh, different uh, forms of uh, farming that will capture carbon, and we will, as our our cap programs are going to be renewed next year with the federal government, and a lot of the innovation and uh, technology that is coming is focused on on carbon capture and uh, I think that's so you'll see uh, there's a real buy-in from our our industry right now and uh, I look forward to uh, to the next few years as we 
we pivot towards uh, focusing on our environment and uh, solutions to uh, our carbon crisis. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks, Chair. You mentioned there a, a couple of programs, existing programs, the community pastures and the, well, you, I, I know that, and I'm looking forward to seeing the new livestock strategy that you're going to table here. I was at the, the Federation of Agriculture meeting when you mentioned that. Those are existing programs, and I'm wondering whether, in order for us to meet these reductions that we've committed to in the Net Zero Plan, are we going to expand those existing programs, or are we going to bring in new programs, or will it be a combination of both? I think it has to be a combination of both. Uh, as we were right in the middle of a review on the ALICE program, I think ALICE is great, but I think we need to put that climate change lens on ALICE even more. And uh, I look forward to the new the review when that comes that comes out uh, when it does. And I think it's a combination of of new and old programs. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. Can you give us an example of what one of the new programs might look like? Well, the SHIP program is one of them, the Soil Health oh. Improvement Plan. That's, that's going to be our key uh, going forward as we work with our, our irrigation strategy and uh, as SHIP is a big part of that. So we're, we have to start at the soil. We have to improve our soil first. And uh, I think uh, with our, our, all this... All the programs we have under the Soil First Farming, I think we can really uh, address some of those uh, issues and uh, we're really putting a focus on soil uh, in, uh, in the department. It's, it's, you know, we're hiring two new specialized staff and uh, soil management and agronomists. I think that's where, you know, we're going to see a big improvement. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. So in order for us to reach these net zero plan targets that, that we've committed to, um, it's going to take money, and I, I, we all have to acknowledge that. I don't see, and I really struggle to see in all of the programs that in my own mind I could imagine contributing to a net zero plan in agriculture, I saw little if no increase in funding. So here we are. We're 2022 now, the, it's 10 to 15 percent reduction by 2030, which is around the corner. Um, when are we going to see increases in funding for programs that we know uh, can contribute to this or new programs? Because there's none this year. Well, I think when our, our new CAP programming comes out, uh, it's going to be revamped with a focus on uh, carbon capture. So. I think you'll see a huge change in funding, maybe not huge, but a, a focused change in funding over the next couple of years as we uh, we uh, revamp our our cap funding. And you know, it's cap is every five years it's revisited, and the cap from five years ago is totally different than you know the focus of agriculture has changed in five years. It's it's a, it's amazing over the past few years how it's changed and. I think uh, this department is ready for the change, and I think island farmers are ready. So, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do this uh, in a reasonable and responsible manner, and uh, I look forward to it. Leader of the opposition. Yeah, I. Um, you mentioned at the very beginning, Minister, that you have a strategic plan for the department. That's wonderful, and presumably, a big part of that strategic plan of sustainability is the goal. Um, is meeting these net zero targets that, that we have. So I'm wondering whether if I were to go online and look at that strategic plan, whether I would see specific spending uh, projections for this. Is that the sort of thing I'll find there? No. no. So where, how, how do you marry that strategic plan to the goals that we have committed to with a net zero plan? Well, I think this is, uh, budgets are a stepping stone to those, uh, you know, this is a first budget and for this year, and uh, you got to see the step in front of you before you <laughs> you go down, and our strategic plan is, a, is, is great, but we have to uh, take the proper steps to get there. Leader of the Opposition. I absolutely agree, and you would have heard me in question period today, Minister Laud, this government, for dealing with things that are right in your face, crises, but not doing well at all with putting in place plans for long-term solutions. And I think what I'm hearing here is a perfect example of that. 
If we are to reach, let's be generous and say 10% reduction by 2030, it was 10 to 15, but we'll say 10. Well, we're putting the, pla we're put we're putting the people in place. We have Adam McLean in place, who's going to focus great on guy. that. Great guy. You know, I'm going to listen to the specialists. I'm going to listen to uh, our department staff that are going to put a focus on, uh, on our carbon capture over the next few years and climate change because everyone is on that path and you know we're hiring specialists everybody who, who who's going to be hired is going to have that focus of climate change so i if you know watch out it's going to come it, it, you know we're we're going to be ready for it but we're just going to take it in a uh, as i say a reasonable and responsible manner so. leader of the opposition so how Let's say we need a, a one percent reduction this year. How, how are we going to achieve that, Minister? Well, I I don't have that answer right now, but I'll, I'm not a climate specialist, but I'll definitely talk to my department. Leader of the opposition, uh, looking at the Soil First initiative, um, again I I went to the web page and it's beautiful, and I can see the staff in your department, including Adam, who are dedicated to at least in part of their time to the Soil First initiative and many others, uh, and also the existing programs that will sort of come together to create this uh, new philosophy of Soil First. But when it came to fi trying to find funding, even in the large budget book here in front of me, the only dedicated funds that I could see for the Soil First program was $4,500, and that was to create um, uh, that web page. So is there any other spending dedicated to the Soil First initiative, or is it simply a web page that promotes the idea of Soil First being important? Well, Soil First is our overall umbrella of all our, our packages. It's more of a, uh, a movement, as you, I, I believe you said, it's a movement to soil, soil uh, it's, it's, it's a great way to farmers to look at it. It's taking all our programming and putting it into one under one umbrella and under the soil first farming. But uh, you know, all our soil health tests <laughs> we're paying for. They're free, Mary, aren't they? No, fourteen hundred soil health tests we did this year, and we're doing that again this year coming up. Uh, I see 167,000 for soil health improvement plans through SHIP, uh, a couple new staff specialize in soil health. So to say we're not doing enough for uh, our soil in the department is maybe not accurate. Leader of the opposition. Yeah, I, I guess, Minister, it's my role and it's our role in opposition to listen to, go to government's uh, promises and and plans that they have in place. In this case, we're talking about the net zero plan and sustainable agriculture's contribution to that. And to say, okay, you committed to a 10 to 15% reduction in eight years, tell me how you're gonna do that. And, and the budget reflects that because you can't, that's not just gonna magically happen. We're gonna have to figure out how many tons of carbon we have to remove from the atmosphere for agriculture to do that. How much is that going to cost per ton, and how are we going to incentivize and ultimately pay farmers for those ecological services? And I, there's nothing that I've heard this afternoon, and nothing that I found in the book that gives me confidence that your department is actually going to get there. <laughs> and that worries me. Noted. Is that, is, was that a question, or? I, or leader, just sorry, leader of the opposition. Well, to be to be fair, uh, I'm not going to argue with you here. But I mean, we are we're debating. We're debating. It's a good debate. Oh, it is. It's great. I appreciate this. And and so do I. And I'll be honest. We are dependent as a department. And maybe I, I, I don't mean to. But maybe these questions, I, I have these same questions for our, the environment department, environment. They are going to be the specialists that, they are the ones that are going to show us how to measure carbon. They are going to be the ones that are going to show us, are going to be the experts on how to uh, be a car carbon accountants. That's what we need. The Department of Agriculture is well aware. 
to meet our targets, we are dependent. And I've brought this up to our federal minister of agriculture at our FPTs. We are dependent like never before. And I have, we have a great working relationship with the Department of Environment, Be best relationship ever. <coughs> and uh, it will continue to grow. And we've made them aware that we need the support for our net zero targets. I mean, agriculture, their net zero plan, I, I've said, is great, but don't forget, <laughs> we can't work in silos on that. We have to work as, 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 because as, we are so dependent on, to reach our goals on them. And until we have those uh, ability to, uh, farmers can do it. We just need to be shown how to do it. And uh, if we can't, if environment's not going to uh, step up, but I think they will, and that's maybe a question for the environment minister when he's on here, um, agriculture will. I mean, we, we're, we have to. So we're going to, we'll be leaders on this, um, but we, we just need the environment to, uh, to assist us for a while. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. And I, I appreciate you bringing that up. And you've said okay. several times that the relationship between the Department of Agriculture and Land and Environment and Climate Change uh, is the best it's ever been. And having watched, I'll put this carefully, those two departments at cross purposes on a number of issues in the past, I'm, I'm thinking of buffer zones primarily here and most recently. I'm really glad to hear that because it's critical that we have climatologists and people who are concerned about that lining up with uh, agronomists and farmers to make sure that we are all pointing in the same direction. Well, one final question on this section, Chair, and I appreciate your latitude. Um, sustainable agriculture, when I asked you what your strategic plan, that was the first thing out of your mouth. And I see last year we underspent on sustainable agriculture. So it's concerning to me that the number one priority that you articulated is being underspent by half a million dollars. And when are we going to see the priorities that you articulate matched with <coughs> budget priorities that actually reflect what you say? Yeah, yeah, you're right. And it's the stewardship program was underspent, and that's that's troubling. Like that's that's the one we should be overspending. And I think we really have to have a a, a sit down with the department, and and that's you know some of the issues is contractors, but there has to be some solutions. We can't keep blaming that there's a lack of people to do the work. Uh, we have to come out with solutions. Um, but we funded all the programs that came in. Uh, we just have to do, do a better job of, you know, uh, promoting more programming because it's a big part of our sustainable plan. Well, Larry Inverness. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Mr. For some of this, uh, it's good to be part of a debate on, on this subject, and I was kind of just cracking to get at it here. I guess one, a couple of comments I wanted to make was one was on the strategic plan. I want to give a, a bit of credit here to John Jameson, former deputy minister. He was big behind that. That was kind of something that was put in place uh, just when I'd come along. And, uh, you know, I could see the value in that as you move forward, right? Um, but I do, you know, when I sort of look at, at this uh, Issue. I've talked to a, a lot of farmers recently. The, this potato ward issue is really uh, um, hitting home up in our area, and we're also seeing, uh, you know, one particular farm, a large seed operator, that's uh, looking at trying to figure out where to go or exit the industry. I'm really concerned about what happens if there's fields that sit fallow. In other words, they don't do anything with those fields from a from a holistic perspective, from carbon capture and things like that. I'm going with the assumptions. That's a big negative. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I, I even, even the guy that rents land at my property there, you know, he's wondering about what I, wh why would I put grain in? I can't, there's, with the increase in fertilizer prices and the massive increases to fuel prices, I can't make that pay. Now, I'll debate a little more, but do you, are you getting that same kind of feedback that the, there's, the, there may be fields just left empty? with nothing in them, and I get concerned about weeds and all the kind of impacts that that might have, mm -hmm. because we'll go with some assumptions that the potato industry will not be expanding its acreage. 
<laughs> would, be, would be a first thought. You've got a lot of fields that would be in their second year, you know, from potatoes last year. You're going to have volunteer issues that may be a bit of an issue. Um, and like I say, I, I'm just wondering, can we get grain into those fields? And is there anything we can do? But are you getting that same kind of feedback that people may not be growing even grain or barley? I, I, I haven't, but it's a reality. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it's probably going to be the most expensive crop. This 2022 crop will be the most expensive crop to put in the ground. And uh, it, yeah, no, I'd say that's a real concern. I do have a, a meeting with the potato board tomorrow, and maybe that's one of the uh, concerns I will bring up. And I know we're, I did meet with the Federation of Agriculture a couple weeks ago, and that hadn't been brought up, but uh, maybe it's something that I can circle back. And if there's some, you know, we need to be at least encouraging our cover crops to help yeah. with that carbon catcher and to keep the weed control uh, somewhat, and uh, maybe that's something uh, we can look at. Well, Larry Inverness? I'm going to give you a suggestion that I think might might be something to look at here. And it, like most farmers, myself included, we, we sometimes would go for a forward contract with the Grain Elevator Corporation. Listening to the news today, we're hearing about potential uh, grain shortages from the Ukraine situation as the breadbasket for Europe. You've got a pretty finite timeline here for farmers to make some decisions, right? So was there any possibility that your department, through sustainable agriculture, could do a backstop maybe a forward contract that allows farmers to grow grain at a, uh, at a, at a margin that they could make a buck at? Or put some, like, like I said before, with the other uh, Minister Fisheries about some sort of a fuel charge rider that allows that to happen? My thinking is... Although today the numbers don't look really good from a grain perspective and, and knowing that the expenses are going to go up, I think that that might change as we move forward into a, another year. And I think if you could do something that would entice the, the farmer to, to grow the grains, the barleys, the oats and things of that nature, the wheat, uh, you know, there, there may be that chance that you won't be out anything, but their risk has been minimized. What, what's your thought about something like that? Yeah, that's something, that's an interesting concept. And uh, so I assume you're thinking working with the grain elevator or is that? Well, well yeah, I guess I'm saying to you, if, if the uh, Department of Agriculture, through some of this funding initiative or the, or the, the potato wart money, you get $20 million sitting there, mm -hmm. uh, is there something that you can do to at least backstop that? So you can, the, the Grain Elevator Corporation can guarantee, you know, $250 a ton or whatever the number is, and uh, make sure our grain, our grain holding facilities are all full mm -hmm. <laughs> at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the farmer then can, they can go to their bank, they can go get the lending if they know that they've got the price coming. Right, right. And uh, I think you, you may not have to pay anything out on that because like I say, is I think the price will go up in future just only because of the world situation that we're in. Okay. So, uh, you know, I think Canada and Prince Edward Island especially, because dur during my time as a minister, we really, Try to you know expand the grain elevator corporation to uh, you know to be able to handle more more uh, commodity, and uh, we've seen our soybean numbers you know increase in the in the province. I just I just wonder if there's some discussion around that. I I, I know I've been throwing out discussions. These don't always like my ideas, but, <laughs> but but I'm trying to throw them out here to say you got to do something that's different. Well, this one's reasonable. So oh, <laughs> I think the other one is too. But uh. <laughs> no. Uh, I, 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 that is interesting concept, and I think yeah, we, I, that's worth a conversation having because I know the farmers right now are at that, as you say, critical time. And uh, over the next probably four weeks, they we, they have to make a decision, and it's a financial decision. It's not just uh, uh, so. I think if uh, I think over the next few weeks, I think we have to have those conversations, and if there's something the department can do. Mm. Um, working with maybe the grain elevators, yeah, I think it's a good idea. So we'll, we'll definitely explore that. All area for us. Okay, I appreciate that. Because I say, I, I emphasize that window is about a month is what you got, you're bang on there. You're a farmer, you know, you know that. You gotta start making decisions from financing and getting seed lined up in your chemicals and know what the costs are to make a decision whether you're gonna do it or not. Uh, another question, just and I know you touched on a little bit with Alice and trying to come up with some, but it, the, the Alice program really does need updating. And it's as simple as it's the financial. It's not, it's not uh, lucrative anymore. Farmers, it, it just, they wouldn't bother uh, 
taking land out of production with the rent that that's offered. So are you is this review that you're doing on this program is something that's going to look at the financial side of that? Oh, absolutely, and it's going to have that climate change lens. So uh, I think I think you should be pay paid not just to take it out, but how much carbon that particular piece of land could capture and uh, as a carbon credit or carbon payment and uh, sequestering payment. So. Hmm. All in for now. Yeah, and I, I agree with all this stuff. Like you said before earlier, farmers need to know how to deal with this carbon capture issue and how they can take advantage of this. But it has to be lucrative enough that they can justify it. I mean, oh, at absolutely. the end of the day, you, you, you farm the fields, I've done it. We, and uh, <laughs> it, when you're making decisions, I'm all for trying to improve the environment, do whatever I can. But it has to, I, I can't put, they take it out of my pocket to do it, right? So, yeah. so, I, so I just wanted to emphasize that. I know the farmers will do those things if the, if the money is there to do that. Uh, question just regarding on the travel and training. I see that there's a, obviously you wouldn't have spent much last year, I'm assuming because of COVID, but you're, you're taking the, what was allocated 31,000 last time down to 13,000 for this year and I'm just kind of wondering with once again fuel prices all those things that are going up how, how is that anywhere is near enough because once again farmers are going to need to take the opportunity to go to uh, information sessions maybe do some uh, uh, travel to another location to sort of get some of these skills so I'm a little wondering that that's quite a cut I guess is what I'm coming from <laughs> when the numbers look like they should be going the other way <laughs> What that is actually it was a soil nitrogen project that was funded through Dalhousie University. That project has ended with Dal, so that's why you're seeing that out. So you'd see it out on the expenditure side and the revenue side. We are continuing to do that work in another area, but it's it's under a grant program now. So, but you're just seeing that that program has ended. That project, it's not a program, it's a project. Okay. Oh, Larry and Vernus. And there'll be no more projects this coming year then, or or a lot smaller we'll amounts have, of projects. There's all kind. Yeah, but there's a project similar to this in, okay. in one of the grant programs now I, in the it was a it was a new it was a climate change it's a climate solutions pilot program mm -hmm. that work is now being done there okay. it's not done within the administrative accounts okay well, no, uh, no further questions on this section shall the section carry yeah. agriculture industry development appropriations provided to assist agriculture industry development for producers and agro -produce, uh, processors to meet market and production opportunities. Administration, 24,500. Equipment, 6,100. Material supplies and services, 44,500. Professional services, 3,500. Salaries, 1,145,100. Travel and training, 30,800. Grants, 3,701,400. Total agriculture industry development, 4,963,900. Leader of the op Opposition. Thank you, Chair. So, um, a lot of money given out in this section, um, or I shouldn't say given out, a lot, a lot of money dedicated to this section. Um, and I, I'm wondering whether, how, how much of the funding from this specific section is devoted to diversifying production, and how much is, is uh, devoted to developing new markets. Both are critical, I, I believe, for the sustainability of our agricultural yeah, sector here on PEI. Go ahead, I'm not sure if I can give you the credit. Like the Agriculture Innovation Research Pro Program, that's a... Um, uh, I'm not sure if I can give you that. There was a lot. There was a large increase in that program this year. When you saw that we had a reduction in sustainable agriculture, we had a large um, number of applications to this particular program, and um, that's designed for um, innovation and adoption projects uh, with yield, economic benefits to it. So whether that fits into what you're talking about there, but so this whole suite of pro programs is. Uh, you know, it varies, but you have your bee pollinization program, so that was for, for the expansion of the, um, of the, uh, the bee sector. Um, once again, this year, it uh, was overspent, and we had a great uptake in that. Um, the organic program, like, these programs were really um, well utilized this year. 
Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. So you, you mentioned these there, Mary. So let's start there in this section. Uh, last year, um, there was, I think, half a million dollars allocated to it, and, and I think it shows the need and the desire for uh, beekeepers here on Prince Edward Island to expand the hives that they have and therefore make PEI self-reliant when it comes to pollinators and therefore eliminate, or perhaps not eliminate, but certainly reduce the risk inherent in importing bees in here to carry out pollination and in importing bees, potentially importing some very serious pests to, that don't currently exist here on PEI. So we were really, really pleased on this side of the house when a, a, a budget request from us to increase funding for this bee program was approved by government and, and instituted last year. I could not find in the big book anything any dollar figures associated with the B program. Either I've missed it or it's not there. You have a different big book from me, but um, um, 4291 well, is, the, uh, is yeah. the code that I have here for it. I see lots of great words about it, and, and I'm excited, by the way. I, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm yeah. thrilled that the B program was over, the expansion program was oversubscribed last year, and I want to make sure that we have enough money in the pot for island beekeepers to continue to expand their hives so that we do reach that point of being self-sufficient? Well, there, there were 19, it should be in your note there, that there were 19 projects approved this year. Um, yeah, yeah, I so, see that. Yeah, so last year, yes, it was, uh, we had a budget last year of $300,000. We spent 500. This year we had a budget of 300, we spent 380. So we are meeting the needs of the requests for the program. So, you know, it, so, anything that came in was approved. So we're feeling that, yes, a $300,000 program is adequate. Uh, but as I said earlier, we, as, the year, as a year goes on, and if we see there's higher requests or need in one program and lower in the other, we do make movement in our programs. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. So Mary, I appreciate those details. And you're right, I see there were 19 projects approved for 2020, 2021, 22. Some examples include importation of queens, purchase of queen rear equipment, purchase of nuclei on full colonies, and purchase of new hives and equipment, but I don't see any dollar figure attached to that. So you're telling me that's $300,000 is what we've allocated? Uh, we forecast $380,000 for those projects last year. That's last year, okay. Year, sorry, this year, during this fiscal year. Right. So it's a forecast, it's not a final number yet because the year's not over, but. Right, so the, the estimate the opposition. Was, sorry, Chair, yeah. my apologies. The estimate was for 300 and we spent 380 yes, last year. So what is the budget estimate for this year? Because, again, I can't find it in my book. Uh, for, for the new year coming up, the budget will be 300,000. Right. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. So first year we overspent by 200,000. Last year we overspent by 80,000. And yet we haven't, uh, we haven't reflected that um, desire to, to use this program in an increased budget this year. Why, Minister, did you not increase the budget for this B program, which is so critical. Well, it is critical, and, uh, you know, almost a million dollars to that industry is a big boost, and I think it's uh, going... Uh, right now, we I think there's a B course going on that 60 people are in, take, interested in taking the B course that uh, is being offered, and uh, I think we're building, and the industry is, you know, this is to build the industry, and eventually... You know, uh, we'll see where it takes, but you know, we're, we've been quite flexible on this, and uh, we want to see this succeed. And uh, uh, every year, there's more and more hives, so hopefully, you know, eventually, you, either you maintain the budget or you, you know. Leader of the opposition, Minister, I'm sorry, I'm hearing all the right words, but I'm seeing none of the right actions here. I'm sorry. Uh, you, see, yeah, okay. you're funding this program. And presumably the goal of the department, and get, correct me if I'm wrong, Minister, is for Prince Edward Island to stop importation of bees to this province so that we can be self-sufficient. When are we going to do that? Uh, hopefully, hopefully sooner than later. Uh, I don't want to... Oh, Minister, it. that's... Uh... <laughs> Leader of the Opposition. Th that's an unacceptable answer. You have funding in place for the future of agriculture on Prince Edward Island. We, we've just been through a year where a pest in a different part of the agricultural sector caused devastation to not only 
farming on Prince Edward Island, but our entire provincial economy. Here we have an opportunity to safeguard ourselves from another import, not importation of pests, but another pest that could be equally devastating to this sector of the, of the agricultural um, industry. And you're sitting there telling me when I'm asking you how much funding is in place, knowing that we have underfunded the program for two years, sooner rather than later. That's not good enough. We need to sort this out. So on that note, what is the what is the status of this year's importation protocols for honeybees? I hope it's the last year we have to do this. I haven't got the update yet, uh, but I will bring that back as soon as I get it. Um, it's still early. We're spring sittings not normally in March, February, so uh, the hives haven't been uh, opened yet uh, because they're still in the, they're still in in winter mode, uh, but. Uh, all reports uh, last fall was that they had a good year and uh, the numbers kept are growing exponentially and uh, you know we funded all the projects that came forward we funded all the projects that came forward and thank you for that leader of the opposition and I, and I do appreciate that minister and I know I got you were pretty point. disappointed a second ago but we did I, fund I, I, all the projects no I, let me be very specific what I'm disappointed in is that in the two previous years we overspent on a budget line. We know this is critical for the health of bees on Prince Edward Island That's and for the agricultural industry, and yet we have a budget line which does not reflect the fact that we overspent in the last two years and we're probably going to overspend this year. And it's just the it's just the sensible thing to do to put more money in this thing so we can avoid potato warp point two in the in the bee industry. Members, it's now time to move on to our next, um, um, I guess, a step in order of the day. So I'll ask uh, the minister to please. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and let the chair report progress and beg to sit again. Shall I carry? As Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, have been under consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty. I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Charlotte Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask that Motion 85 be now read. Charlotte Carey. Carey. Motion 85, supporting the Isle of Elders, has been read and debate was adjourned by the Minister of Social Development and Housing. He was almost done. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing to continue debate. Yes. Uh, well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, we've heard many times in this House, and I've spoken many times in this House, most recently during greetings and in the previous debate about this motion, about how valuable our seniors are, how much they continue to contribute to life on our yes. island, um, and how we, we need to treat them uh, with respect and dignity, and uh, how, in fact, um, in this, this government, I believe we're really working hard to make that happen, and I think that's what this is all about. I know working with my colleague, the Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, he's, he's passionate about helping seniors. Um, we've, we've had questions, you know, uh, from the member from Tignish Palmer Road about community care facilities versus long-term care facilities, and I think that's part of what the mover was talking about in this motion and how we, we make sure that they're serving the needs of seniors. And, and we're, we're working to make progress. I remember, Mr. Speaker, uh, when I was in opposition years ago, and the member from... Um, 
O'Leary Inverness was Minister of Health. There was a standing committee meeting, and I remember having very similar discussions about long-term care and community care facilities. So these are problems that have been for, around for a long, long time. Uh, we're hoping to make some progress on them over here in, in our government, and I think you'll see that over the, the coming uh, months. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, seniors continue to serve their communities in meaningful ways and the lasting legacies that will forever be treasured. PEI seniors deserve to be treated with dignity and respect, and by working together, we can support older adults to stay safe, healthy, and continue to be active members of our island communities. Uh, I wholeheartedly support this motion and recognize that every day government staff work to address challenges that seniors face. And the Department of Social Development and Housing, uh, who I represent as Minister, welcomes any opportunity to further enhance the supports to seniors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and the Third Party Health Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to get up and talk about this motion. And as the minister said, like we're, we're all trying to support seniors, and there's definitely some some gaps in what what government needs to do, where we are because of the pandemic, and and where we need to get to. And I think where we need to get to is we have an aging population, and the whatever whatever we're facing now, you can surely think that the numbers, the issues will be magnified within the next 10 years because our population is aging at a rapid rate and we're not ready now and we, I, don't, I don't know if we're going to be ready then and that's what I'm concerned about. Um, when, when, when it comes to this motion, you know, I look at the, and whereas elders on PEI face a wide array of challenges that government must address including food security, unsafe housing, loneliness and poverty. Um, those are four things, and you know, you, you, you look at them, food security, government passed on an on a, on a opportunity to do more than just pilot a food, seniors food program in the eastern part of Prince Edward Island. It, 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 the, the minister has been, the minister has been, we've talked about this before, and, and I do believe it's important right now, given, given uh, inflationary pressures and what our seniors are facing, to get that sped up. And it's not it's not pilot time; it's go time. And and I think that that's that's something that that you can do uh, right away. Unsafe housing, and I mean I mean uh, the opposition and myself have both faced issues in 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 our housing areas or, or what's in our communities that that people feel unsafe. And and a lot of these people are within government area housing. And and I mean, uh, I'll give the I'll give the minister some credit. We've had a good meeting with Hunt Court um, in my area, and that was very important. Um, but it's it's not going to stop because the issues got too bad. The issues got too bad, and and pe people are coming to me on a regular basis. And I would be remiss if I if I didn't stand up and said that I'm listening, and we want it to be better, and we want you to live safe. So I think those are important. Uh, loneliness, for sure, absolutely. People are lonely, and they're scared to go out. Um, the pandemic has has forced them to 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 retreat. Like you're doing something good if you if you stay in your house where you're alone or you're 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 just attached to whatever you're doing day after day. We've got to be there to encourage people when the time is right to get out and combat this. How are we how are we attacking that? And poverty. Well. Poverty among seniors, there's more seniors going the other way and slipping into poverty than coming out of poverty at the moment. And that's a, that's a huge, well, it's because, it, it's because, Minister, um, well, it's, how do I get those numbers? Look around. Look around. Just last night, there's a 12% increase in gas. It's gone up an incredible amount. How are seniors going to afford that on a fixed income? How are they going to get out of poverty? They, they are on a fixed income, and the prices around them have gone up. So it's a very big issue. That's how I've got those numbers. I don't even have to look at the numbers. I know from talking to people in my community. Um, and we talked about it before. Uh, my colleague from O'Leary and Vanessa talked about quality of care quality of care right now because there's staffing shortages in long-term care. They're not receiving the same care. I, that's, that's something else that I think could be under here too. And wellness, 
um, people's wellness goes along with loneliness, but what are you doing, what is the government doing to proactively make sure that wellness activity, things are moving on to, to a senior level? And it can, if you want ideas, I can give them to you right now, but it's, you, you want ideas, no. We need to work on that. We need to get seniors out and get them moving. Um, and the next, the next one, the challenges in our long-term care homes that the pandemic has highlighted are significant and must be addressed at a systemic level immediately. Um, when, when, I, when I see that, I, I don't know because there, there's, problems with, there's problems with management, there's problems with leadership, there's problems with direction, I believe that but I trust the people that work in these facilities and is at a systemic level. And I don't really necessarily love seeing the word systemic in here because I think it's a word that needs to really represent. And when I look at that, I think about the black population and I think about the BIPOC populations and it, I just don't love seeing that. Even though it might be a systemic, I think it's, a, it's an exploitation of the word. Um, and that's just how I feel about it. Um, moving on to the next one, private long-term care homes have had significant challenges during the pandemic across Canada in PEI and PEI have highlighted the need for public or not-for-profit approaches to care for our elders. I think it's, I think it's bad across public or private. I think the long-term care issues have to be looked at across the board. And um, I, have two, I have two public facilities in the areas that I represent and talking to the staff, they're just as stressed as the, as the people that work at the private facility. I think it needs a, a, a holistic look across the board and what those workers, and I'll be able to talk about that hopefully tomorrow, but what the workers are facing every day and what they're dealing with. And, and is, it, is it something that we have to look at now? Yes, we have to look at now. And, and I'm not sure the government's response to that is adequately serving the people who are in long-term care now. Um, and, you know, when you look at this in, this, in this motion, it talked about people are going into long-term care too early. Um, I, I'm not too sure about that because every case is, every case is different. I mean, if, you're, if your mom is having to go into long-term care, is that different? Is it, I, I don't know across the board if, if we can say that. But what I do know is that PEI does have the highest rates in Canada about people staying in long-term care. And how do we get across that? I think it moves in two different streams. One's proactive, which is your seniors independence program and those type of things. And the other one, we, we can't do anything about. We need to be able to provide them with care. So there's two different streams. And if you're not working on them uh, holistically and together, uh, we're, we're gonna face big problems. So that's what I, I feel about that. But it is an issue. And I, I like the idea of supporting island seniors, absolutely. And I think the, the last line, um, that the, the legislature urged government to invest and promote policies and support elders and address the challenges that, that they are facing is, is, uh, is a good, therefore, be it resolved. Um, I would like to see it stronger, and I would just like to talk to the two ministers over there is that you, you, have, to, you have to work at this, and you have to continue to go and, and make sure the funding is there for island seniors in the two different streams and, and what we're facing because with the aging population, with what they've been through, they deserve it. They built our island, and we have to be there to support them. And, and, I, and I think that you, you sure. hopefully get the message of this, um, of this motion, but it's going to take leadership. We, we have to make it so that no senior is left behind. And um, I want to thank, too, I don't think our province, I don't think our province thanks our volunteers that help seniors out, whether they be at home, um, whether they be in long-term care, they come in, they, they don't ask for anything, they just support their seniors, and our volunteers have done a great job of supporting seniors in this province. And, and I just want to take a second to thank all our volunteers because without them, um, we'd, we'd be in rough shape. So I guess I just, uh, I really thank, uh, thank uh, the opposition for bringing this, this forward. There's a lot of things we need to work on and, and I really think that our province would be better off um, if we supported this and, and did, did something concrete. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to rise to speak to this motion. Um, 
I appreciate my colleague from uh, Charlottetown Victoria Park for bringing it forward and uh, trying to shine a light on just exactly what we've been hearing from Islanders um, for a long time and what we've been trying to bring forward in this house. And, um, and frankly, <laughs> sometimes I feel like, you know, we keep on saying what we're hearing from Islanders and then in responses from the ministers, it's like they make it sound like they're doing everything right and that they're doing everything that Islanders, especially our elders, need. But if you were, would we be hearing from this many Islanders? And I fear that it falls on deaf ears a lot of the times. So I'm going to start. I've I have a lot of notes that I've written on this subject um, over the last little while from things that I've heard from different emails that have come in and, and that kind of thing. And Mr. Speaker, I think I'm going to start with alternate level of care. So Mr. Speaker, we have one of the highest number of alternate level care night stays in our hospitals here in PEI across the country. And for those who don't know what an alternate level of care is, it's in this sense, when someone no longer needs to be in the hospital for medical reasons, but because they've recovered from their injuries or, or they have recovered enough that they no longer have to be in the hospital, so they're medically discharged. So this is, um, but they can't receive the adequate care that, they, care that they need at home. So this is often from an elder falling while at home or possibly having a stroke. Um, they stay in the hospital to receive help with maybe going to the bathroom or feeding um, while they're waiting for a bed in a long-term care facility. And we all know that there's a wait list in, for long-term care. And uh, it's something that's not getting better. And um, they receive the problem with alternate level of care and keeping somebody in the hospital is it's not a digni dignified way to live. We've all been in the hospital, and although the carers that are in the hospital, whether it be the nurses, the LPNs, the physicians, you know, the volunteers, whomever, they're doing everything that they possibly can. But let's be honest, it's not the place that elders should go to age. And unfortunately, we have um, elders that are staying in, in alternate level of care within the hospital for months. Um, they receive no social schedule. They often live in a ward-type room and it's a revolving door of roommates. And the only social interaction they may receive is visits from family members, friends, church members, or service, um, service, community service groups. And that's if those, they have those, con those um, connections. And that's, that's only when visitation isn't restricted for some reason. Is this living with dignity? If we respected elders, we would address this by investing in public care in home care and in public long-term care beds. But this government isn't doing that. If we're having this alternate level, if having this alternate level of care wasn't bad enough, our elders are actually having to pay for it. So Mr. Speaker, one Islander I spoke to is paying over $80 a day for alternate level of care. They're paying $80 a day to stay in the hospital with no other social interactions. Living as an ALC patient in one of our hospitals does not give you the ability to apply for long-term care subsidies. So this is literally, literally money coming out of the pocket of an elder or a senior or from their, their spouse, and they can't get any subsidy. Uh, we know seniors are living on a fixed income and can't pay for this. Um, one Islander so I spoke to, she had to reti retire early, so um, they couldn't continue to pay the $80 a day, more than $80 a day, to keep their, her loved one in hospital while they were waiting for the long-term care home. So they made the choice that she would retire from work. And um, the financial repercussions in the future for her to do this, we know that when women lose their spouses, because especially in that generation, they were typically stay-at-home moms or caregivers, so they didn't work in the workplace. So their CPP isn't as high. And so when they lose their spouse, it is way more financially impactful for a woman in her elder years to lose her spouse than it is for a man to lose his. So it's absolutely, it was absolutely necessary for her to take her husband home. 
um, because she couldn't afford that added that added um, financial burden on their family. So the financial stress, the emotional stress, and the physical stress that it put it on her family was way, it was just, it's unfair. And really, this is downloading government's responsibility on families, on regular islanders, with no, with really no um, uh, care as to how that's going to impact their family. And it's just not a way to live. But it's necessary because we live in a jurisdiction where home care is underfunded, and consecutive governments hasn't bothered to prioritize our elders by building additional long, public long-term care. Mr. Speaker, um, another thing I would like to uh, I'd like to highlight, well, talk about is one sister of a resident, um, and she's actually I've spoken in this house a number of times about the long-term care subsidy. And it, they're in the regulations, there used to be a whole list of exemptions that um, if somebody paid for their private medical insurance or if they paid for, um, you know, out of their a retirement savings for community care or house repairs or whatever, that would be able to automatically come off the bottom line of their, um, of their income. Because it's not income, let's be honest. And in the House, a couple of days ago, when I asked the question for the third time in this House, the minister, respond, the minister responded to me saying, hey, I did that in December. With no care to think that there's islanders waiting for those exemptions to be in place, there was no thought to go back to anybody who was denied those subsidies. And no thought to reach out to MLAs that might have been dealing with people who were dealing with this issue. So I find it really hard to understand a minister saying they care so much about our seniors, but when they make a change in legislation that was negatively impacting them in the first place and they don't bother to tell you or to tell them that they've changed that negative regulation so that now they can actually go back and look for those supports, and they don't bother to tell you. That's not, that's not caring about an elder as far as I'm concerned. So I'd like to talk about everyday care in our long-term care facilities. Um, I was speaking with uh, um, a volunteer and she uh, works with a group, of, a group of young people and as one of their community service things that they did, they, at Christmas time, they made gift bags for seniors. And one of the things, so when I saw the list, one of the things that I saw on the list was moisturizer, was soap. I'm like, why on earth would soap and moisturizer be on the list of things that seniors living in care should need? Wouldn't that be something that's available that they should be getting as part of their thousands of dollars that they pay for a month? She told me um, that the moisturizers and the institutional and the soap smell like an institution. Yeah. And Mr. Speaker, seniors do not want to smell like an institution. Yeah. Seniors want to feel good about themselves. Some residents can't stand smelling like an institution. So why are we mass buying? stinky, smelly, institutional soaps and, and moisturizers to make our seniors feel bad every day. They like to smell like nice things. They like to smell like lavender. I was told just because they are elderly doesn't mean they don't want to smell nice for when they go to their social times with their friends or their beaux. They want to feel good. They moved into continue, continuing living, continued living not to, not to die, but to live. And we're treating them in the office. When we start institutionalizing elder care, we are making decisions on behalf of the residents that live in their homes. But Mr. Speaker, the exemptions that we use that, um, that don't benefit them and that hurt them financially really needs to be addressed. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to talk, take a moment to talk about our carers. The people who care for aging loved ones. The people who will care for us when we age. 
um, or just need a little bit of extra, a little bit of an extra hand. And I've spent a lot of time in this house during this sitting, recognizing and speaking on behalf of these carers, our RCWs, our licensed practitioner, practitioner nurses, our RNs, and our par paramedics, mostly, uh, most notably. But Mr. Speaker, this government continues to do nothing to help our frontline professionals who do so much important work. So I speak on their behalf again, and I will continue to do so until the day we see improvement. Today in this House, I spoke about our, regist our registered nurses. I spoke about the terrible pay that they get in overtime, and I spoke about um, how they are, how they're treated. I was, I was told by one RN that when there's, uh, there's, um, when there is on-call pay or on-call time, and nobody has put their hand up for it, they draw it out of a hat. How's that digni dignified? How's that treating people with respect? Mr. Speaker, we know that the frontline healthcare workers need all the support that we can get, and we heard from the minister today. I know it's a problem. I wish it wasn't a problem. My goodness, there's one person in this house that can fix the problem, and it's a minister, and the minister isn't doing it. So although the Premier would love to have you believe that these frontline professionals have every opportunity to speak out without fear, this is simply not the case. Almost every email I receive from frontline healthcare staff is sent under a false name, or it is set, they're calling from a private number, or they're begging me, please don't let anybody find out that I was speaking to you because I would lose my job. Exactly. So again, until these workers can speak out for themselves without fear, then I need to continue to speak out for them. And it's heartwarming every single email that I receive calling for improvements in senior care. It's heartwarming that they always talk about the carers. They always talk about how hard the residential, residential care workers are trying, how kind the LPNs are to them, how they've, they were so fortunate to have the paramedics that arrived at their home for um, palliative care and they were so kind to the family. These are the people that we really need to stand up for each and every day to ensure that they can continue the hard work that they're doing in order to make sure that our elders are properly cared for. Because if we don't speak for them, then what we're going to do is we're going to lose more and more of them out of the workforce, and our elders can't afford that. They need us to stand up for them right now. Mr. Speaker, I spoke earlier about different ways that we can be supporting elders and keeping them in their homes, and one way to do that is through home care which is critically underfunded. And frankly, lots of families don't even know that it's available or what that means. I know when my dad was sick, we had no idea where to go, what to do, how, who to turn to. Because when you've never had to reach out for help, it is foreign to you and you actually don't know where to go. But I caution the speaker on, or I caution the minister on this. Home Instead is a company, it's a privately run company that does home care in seniors' homes. They have approximately, I think it's 100 clients. Mr. Speaker, they just sent a, a, a letter out to their care workers and told them that they were closing up shop. <clears throat> Three weeks, those 100 seniors that are getting home care from that company, in three weeks they won't have home care anymore. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, frankly, that's why we on this side have talked so much about privatization. Because when you have a private company working and doing things that government's supposed to be doing, they can pull up shop any time, they can leave at any time. And what happens? The services that they're provided are no longer, are no, no longer available. And frankly, Mr. Speaker, there's 100 elders receiving home care from this company that are no longer going to be receiving it at the end of March. And what has this government done to prepare for that? So I'll be frank, I'm getting a little sick and tired of hearing everything that we've done. Because I don't feel like we've done enough. 
I'm getting a little sick and tired of all these programs that they list as if it's like candy in a, in a candy jar. That's not what that's about. It is about piecing together holistic approaches of taking care of our elders and making sure that living in the best time of their life is actually the best time in their life. And frankly, Mr. Speaker, if you listen to all of those programs that people are rhyming off as if, you know, all it is is another thing, another checkbox, if you asked Islanders if government is doing enough to take care of, their, of our seniors, I have 45 letters in 24 hours that would tell you you're not. Yep. Yep. So I'm tired of listening to ministers stand up and say what a great job they're doing. Because if you're not talking to Islanders and if you're not talking to them about the care that they're receiving and how you could do it better, frankly, you've forgotten who elected you and you've forgotten who you're supposed to be working for in the first place. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll have to follow. <laughs> I tell you, being on this team makes me very proud. Makes me very proud to be on the side of the House that speaks truth to power and isn't afraid to say what we're hearing from Islanders every day, even though other members in the House think that the stories of truth that come from Islanders are funny. Um, this isn't funny, Mr. Speaker. It's not funny when we're talking about our elders and the dignity that they deserve. It's not funny when we're talking about people who are having to make decisions about whether they can eat or buy their medication. Um, you know, but maybe we don't realize how many seniors, but we spoke today about being, today being International Women's Day, that, and that women tend to live longer and often left on their own when their partner has passed or is in care. And that a single woman on her own, um, especially you know, as a senior, is least likely to have any other form of income. It's most likely that she actually was a stay-at-home mom or worked her whole life um, in non-paying or low-paying jobs that didn't give her CPP contributions. That means that like, her income is only OAS and the GIS top-up. OAS is taxed, Mr. Speaker. So your pre-tax payment, your maximum that you could get as a single woman um, on OAS GIS is $1,562 a month. And from that $1,562 that's pre-tax, you then need to pay your rent, your food, your medication, maybe your vehicle if you're lucky enough to have one. I don't know about you, but I, I can't make that math work, Mr. Speaker, and an awful lot of people in our communities can't make that math work. We are not joking when we say that we're hearing from seniors who are having to make these difficult choices every single day, who have to visit the community fridge. Fixed income is not somewhere that you can kind of navigate your way out of through calling 211. A fixed income isn't something that you can navigate your way out of as our cost of living goes up 15, 16% in one month. And Mr. Speaker, if we, need to, if we want to invest in support um, and promote policies that support elders, we have to be honest about the challenges that they're facing, and we have to be honest about how the programs that we supply have to actually meet their needs for all seniors. With that, Mr. Speaker, I will um, adjourn debate and look forward to returning another time, seconded by the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Shirley Kerr. The Honourable Member from Monaco Kilmuir and the Government Whip. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Member from Cornwall Meadowbank that Motion 94 be now read. Shall it carry? Yeah, yeah. Motion 94. The Member for Cornwall Meadowbank moves, seconded by the Member for Charlottetown Winslow, the following motion. Whereas Access PEI is a one stop shop location to obtain government programs and services. And whereas the launch of the Access PEI service, sorry, and whereas since the launch of the Access PEI service, Islanders have had the opportunity to access services in eight local communities across the province, improving service delivery and reducing travel requirements for the public to obtain certain government services. 
and whereas currently the Access PEI location in Charlottetown is the only location to serve the greater capital region of Charlottetown, Stratford, Cornwall, and neighboring communities with a combined population in excess of 60,000. And whereas the Access PEI Charlottetown location serviced approximately 55,000 customers in 2020 and 2021, accounting for approximately 40% of all provincial users of the Access PEI service. <coughs> And whereas due to population growth and other factors, the demand for services has created bottlenecks for customers of the Access PEI Charlottetown location. And whereas in response to the pandemic, Access PEI has embarked on a successful pilot to offer more contactless service options online and by phone. And whereas the introduction of satellite access locations in the capital region could help further reduce administrative backlogs for islanders looking to access government services. And whereas between 2016 and 2021, the town of Cornwall grew its population by more than 22% and was the 14th fastest growing municipality in Canada, according to the 2021 census. And whereas the addition of a satellite, satellite access PEI location in the town of Cornwall would further bolster institutional capacity and development in a fast growing municipality. And whereas the addition of a satellite access PEI location in the town of Cornwall would have climate change benefits of lower greenhouse gas emissions through reduced travel times to access services in the town of Cornwall and neighboring communities. Therefore, we resolve that this assembly urge government to explore the feasibility of establishing a satellite access PEI location in the town of Cornwall to help reduce operational service pressures, improve the customer experience, build institutional capacity within developing local communities, and help reduce carbon emissions. I'll call on the Honourable Member from Cornwall Middle Banks to start the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A little bit of redundancy today in the theme, but uh, we'll, we'll carry on. Uh, it's my great pleasure to rise today to move Motion 94 regarding access, P access PEI in the Town of Cornwall, which I represent. Before I, I begin, I want to thank my Honourable Colleague, the Member from Charlottetown Winslow, for agreeing to second this motion. This is my first time moving a motion, so I'm glad I'm the subject of that motion is a valuable public service for Islanders, Access PEI. My intent with bringing forward this motion is to help underscore many of what I feel are compelling reasons why the provincial government should explore the feasibility expanding the service offerings of Access PEI in the capital region through the satellite office in the fast-growing town of Cornwall. After listening to my remarks and other debate, I'm hopeful that other honourable members, members will agree in the chamber. Access PEI was designed as a one-stop shop where Islanders could access a, ver a variety of government services through counter service. The idea at the time was to improve customer service for the public, support community development, and reduce travel, which brings environmental benefits through less carbon emissions, a goal even more important today. From its origins in the mid-1990s, today there are eight Access PEI locations in communities across Prince Edward Island. Since its creation over time, Access PEI is has also been to offer certain government services online. This is certainly encouraging and no doubt an area that will be expanded over time to improve the ease of access. However, these options and technical solutions may not be available for all programs and services and due to the wide range of programs and services, some will also require some level of in-person service. With that in mind, it's no surprise that Access PEI has grown into a demand service for Islanders. When Access PEI was first started, the population of PEI was only about 134,000. As we debated last week in the House when we discussed our provincial population strategy, we have seen tremendous growth in the province's population in the, in the last few years. Census data shows that Prince Edward Island continues to have the highest rates of population growth in, in all of Canada. Today, more than 30,000 more Islanders now call PEI home they, than, than they did when Access PEI service was first launched. The growth in people has been particularly felt in what I'll call the capital region, Charlottetown, Stratford, and Cornwall. The population of all these three communities has been on a steady climb, with Stratford for many years holding the title of the fastest growing community in Atlantic Canada. Now the town that I represent, Cornwall, is also posting uh, impressive numbers when it comes to population growth. So much now that Cornwall is, is obviously is the 14th fastest growing community in Canada. With more people comes more demand for government services, including those offered by Access PEI locations. We can see that extra demand in many areas of society. Higher school enrollments, access to health services, and even housing, ser housing have all felt the pressure of these increased demands on service. 
Access PEI is no stranger to these pressures. The Access PEI location on Riverside Drive is the only location in the capital region servicing all of Charlottetown, Stratford and Cornwall. Not only does it make it sense to, for, it, for, Corn, for Cornwall to be a location, uh, it would actually help people from both the South Shore even in, in even the West Royalty, um, even half of Charlottetown could access. So it would actually divide Charlottetown in half um, to help manage demand. Uh, in the 2021 fiscal year, the Access PI location served approximately 55,000 customers. This is only increasing. Luckily, those 55,000 customers weren't all there at once because it's cramped quarters at the best of times. Uh, I did speak to a few employees at Access PEI, and the wait times have not been at, um, increased because of COVID. As he said, we just now wait in our cars instead of waiting inside the building. It, that has not changed. Um, those 55,000 customers um, accounted for about 40% of all the U Access PEI services last year, and that's only going to increase. With all the people people that live in these three communities of the capital region, it was probably inevitable that bottlenecks would emerge with that volume of business being transacted at a single location. And those bottlenecks have emerged as anyone who has used the access PEI location recently can attest. In response to this, the staff at Access PEI have taken steps to try and accommodate this increased volume, including more online and cont contactless service options, dedicated hours for seniors and other measures. These are good measures, to be sure, and worthy of applause, but they not, may not be getting at the root of the issue, which is the bottleneck created by increased demand for service from an increasing population base. That's why I think that the government should explore the feasibility of setting up a satellite access PI location somewhere in the town of Cornwall. A satellite, satellite access PI location in the town of Cornwall would serve many benefits, both direct and indirect, Mr. Speaker. A satellite access PEI location in the town of Cornwall would help reduce pressure on the existing location on Riverside Drive. Having another location in the capital region would hopefully shorten wait times to the public and improve the customer experience. A satellite access location in the town of Cornwall would also help toward our province's goals to reduce carbon emissions through reduced travel. Currently residents in my district, the leader of the opposition's district, and even the premier's district need to drive to access PEI location on Riverside Drive on the far side of the city. Having a satellite access PI location in Cornwall would mean, would mean reduced travel distances for residents in those areas to obtain services they need with reduced fuel costs and carbon emissions. Travel from Bonshaw or West River to an access PI location in Cornwall would certainly be more convenient and carbon friendly than on the far side of the Charlottetown bypass. A satellite access PI location in the town of Cornwall would also assist in the forward progress of community development. With the completion of the Cornwall Bypass, the town of Cornwall is working on a long-term development plan to build up the commercial core of the town along Main Street. Having a satellite access location in Cornwall would add to the institutional capacity in the town and act as a catalyst for future investment in commercial and residential development in the area. As we look ahead into the future, it's not unreasonable to expect that this current growth arc will continue, to, uh, will continue in our area for a while yet. In summary, Mr. Speaker, there are compelling reasons for the government to take a closer look at the idea of a satellite access PEI in the town of Cornwall. This is simply a business case. It would reduce service pressures on the existing access PEI location in Charlottetown, improving productivity. It would offer a more geographically suitable location for residents of Cornwall, Meadowbank, West River, Bonshaw, and even Charlottetown and beyond. It would help reduce carbon emissions through reduced travel distances. It would also add to the growth of institutional capacity in the town of Cornwall. And it would serve as a catalyst for future growth, development, and investment. If the data supports the business case, I believe that the province would have an eager partner in the town of Cornwall. I think that the time has come for the government to give this idea due consideration on its merits. My intent in bringing forward this motion was to get the discussion going and hopefully spark a closer examination of the potential for a satellite access PEI location. With that said, I will conclude my remarks and thank my fellow honorable members for their time and attention, and I hope that they will be able to support this motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Call on the second of the motion, the honorable member from Charlottetown, Winslow. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, yeah, I do want to uh, uh, thank the honorable member uh, for the uh, opportunity to speak to uh, his first motion uh, in this legislative assembly. And, 
Um, of course, uh, you may have heard that the motion is a very heavy Cornwall area, and um, I uh, asked my wife who teaches in the Honourable Members District, uh, teaches East Wilshire, and I said, would it be easier for you if you had to go get your driver's license, maybe drive into Cornwall? or drive down to Riverside Drive. And she said, oh, it would be a lot easier if I just had to drive into Cornwall and grab it. So that's why I wanted to uh, put my name as a seconder on this motion, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Honourable Member talked about uh, all of the great benefits of uh, having access PEI and, um, you know, of course, uh, as mentioned, to get your driver's license, get your motor vehicle inspection, uh, pay your property taxes. Uh, water testing, Mr. Speaker, which is often forgotten, and maybe that's just a reminder for the, uh, the pub public that you can get that done there. And uh, most recently, of course, it was a place to uh, pick up your rapid tests uh, for a COVID rapid test. Um, the Riverside Drive location has been there, if I'm not mistaken, at its current location for about 25 years, and, and it is a great location. Um, you know, of course, uh, the honourable member mentioned uh, in his remarks there about the you know the growth that Stratford has and continues to have, and uh, you know, of course. 25 years ago, uh, you know, in Charlottetown, a lot of the population was in that downtown core. You know, it started to spread out a little bit, but you know, as the uh, honourable uh, minister of education would see as well, in East Royalty and West Royalty, the growth has been huge in those areas, and you know, of course, uh, covering the the Winslow area um, and the growth in Cornwall. It's been mentioned a few times in this health, uh, house, rather that you know. It is the biggest growing uh, community, I believe, with over 5,000 people, uh, or 14th biggest, sorry. So, yeah, I, I do support the idea of maybe if the government would explore looking at different locations uh, for an access PEI, again, noting the growth. Like a lot of people from, you know, Winslow area, West Royalty area, you know, having to make that drive all the way down to Riverside Drive, it might be more convenient for, uh, you know, a location in the uh, Cornwall area. <coughs> Community, capital area, I believe you had mentioned in your remarks, Honourable Member. Um, even just from this point of view, Mr. Speaker, in District 10 specifically, um, at the corner of Mount Ebert Road and Sherwood Road, in that area connecting to the bypass, um, I, I, I'm going to make a mistake here, I know I am, because I'm going to name some of the car dealerships that, you know, of course, would have to do those MVIs. But hopefully I don't miss anyone um, you know uh, we've got of course Brown's Volkswagen uh, on Sherwood Road we've got Phillips Auto Sales Charlottetown Toyota the corner of the bypass and Mountain River Road um, Island Auto Sales Reliable Motors right on Malpec Road and uh, the Affordable Car Company which is a new car dealership uh, to the district along with uh, Island Auto Sales uh, Charlottetown Mitsubishi and of course uh, the Centennial Group have two locations one for the dealership and then one for uh, Practicare um, so Phillips Auto Sales, yes. Um, so, like I said, I, I, I guarantee you that, that they would probably appreciate not having to make that trip all the way down Riverside Drive and maybe a more central location uh, to, you know, just for the MVI side of things, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I do uh, commend the, uh, the department as well, of course, with the, the modernization of the programs as well. I, I do think this is a great thing. Um, you know, I can remember the very first time with a little uh, trepidation uh, when I, uh, I, I'm not much for online shopping and online doing things. My, my, my wife is, she's awesome at it. She is, she does a great job. But, so I can remember the first time when I'm like, uh oh, I think my uh, motor vehicle inspection is gonna be due this month. And my birthday falling at the end of the month, it's always troublesome, right? Because I'm like, uh oh, this is coming up tomorrow. Access PEI is closed, so what am I going to do? So I'm like, I'm going to do it online. And I remember feeling a little bit nervous, but then I got the confirmation email and everything was good to go. So I do appreciate the modernization of that because, again, some people like to do their things online, get them done, you know, not have to worry about the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, lastly, too, the staff. The staff at Access PEI is great. And, you know, we, we've used that word, and I've heard it so many times, but about a pivot. Um, they, they pivoted during COVID. Um, you know, you remember the tents being set up uh, it, during COVID, you'd be driving down Riverside Drive and you'd see the tent set up and, you know, they were making sure that people were feeling safe while they had to get these necessary services taken care of. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't want to talk too long. I just uh, kind of wanted to throw my support behind the Honourable Member's first motion in this House and uh, hopefully we'll garner support. And just in, in the actionable clause, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, where it says that this Assembly urged government to explore the feasibility of establishing a satellite access PEI location in the town of Cornwall 
to help reduce operational service pressures, improve the customer experience, build institutional capacity within developing local communities and help reduce carbon emissions. So my, my hope is that the department will explore the feasibility. Um, if the feasibility is not there, or if they feel there might be another location, I would recommend maybe the north of Charlottetown, which is an area which I represent as well. Um, you know, in the western end, uh, I know the member from uh, Charlottetown West Royalty might agree with me, but again, I, I do implore the government to, to look at the feasibility, and of course, if the feasibility might be in District 10, I'm not going to complain. I'm sure my constituents wouldn't as well. I know Royalty Crossing would be a great location. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, but no, Mr. Speaker, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today to the uh, Honourable Member's first motion, and I do throw my support behind his motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Here we go. Starting the Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, Mr. Speaker, I don't have any stories today about um, about horses uh, uh, or anything like that. Uh, I'm going to try to stick to the... The horse the, did live. Yeah, the horse did survive, thank God for that. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, you know, with this this, um, this motion coming forward, I want to congratulate the Honourable Member for, for bringing this forward and being such a strong advocate for, for his district. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, it's, it's not that long ago that uh, I can recall um, when you had to renew your driver's license, everybody had to do it. I believe it was at the end of January, the end of March, and the motor vehicle uh, was housed in the basement of the polyclinic. And at that time, uh, basically the final day, the last day of that month, you would see people lined up all the way dr down Grafton Street um, to go into that building to get their uh, driver's license renewed. So I, I, I think about where we were where we are now and where we're going in the future. Um, as the Honourable Members mentioned, uh, a lot of the initiatives that have been introduced as of late, uh, the contactless service, the telephone service, uh, the Honourable Member um, uh, talked about his wife, it would be more convenient for her to go to a Cornwall location to get her license renewed. Well, you know what? Even more convenient would be just to go online and do it, because that option is there. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I said, I want to thank the member from Cornwall Meadowbank for bringing forward this motion and the wonderful job he's doing on behalf of his constituents. <clears throat> the motion speaks to the continuing growth uh, of our communities, particularly in Queen's County, and expanded access PI services for the region is something that we are currently discussing within the department. As some members of the Legislative Assembly may be aware, the department's lease for a Riverside Drive location will be up in March of 2024. So we're already looking to the future to see uh, what we could do. Uh, we realize already that uh, that, that uh, location on um, Riverside Drive, uh, although it has served its purpose, it's, it's, uh, it's currently uh, uh, not completely what we require as far as um, the infrastructure goes. Um, we're currently developing a plan for Queens County that will meet the diverse needs of our growing population. And, and again, I'll. I'll remind the members that, uh, once again, Stratford is and has been um, the fast, second fastest growing uh, community uh, just behind, uh, um, no, <laughs> not Fresco, <laughs> just, behind, just behind Moncton and the, and the greater area over there. And that's been uh, ongoing for, for several years now. I believe we're currently uh, just a little over 11,000 uh, residents in Stratford. And uh, with what's on the horizon for development through the Gray Group um, and, and the, the plan, strategic uh, plan moving forward, uh, we're only going to see uh, a lot more growth in the Stratford area. Feasibility <laughs> study. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we would like to see Access PEI co located with other government services, municipal, provincial, and federal, so that Islanders have ease of access to all the programs and services they require, all under one roof. And our service must be accessible with locations using the public trans, uh, transportation route. Um, Mr. Speaker, I know that there's, there's talk about um, some new construction coming up in the Cornwall area. Um, I would encourage uh, the Honourable Member, if he's speaking to some of these developers, 
to make sure that they're putting a, an environmental lens on any new construction because when, a, when an RFP does eventually go out for, uh, for new locations, uh, certainly we're going to take uh, an environmental lens uh, because of our, our um, um, pro net zero stance and, and uh, if we're leasing space, we want to ensure that it's uh, net zero as well. Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, I want to take this opportunity to speak broader about the work being done to improve citizen experience and interaction with government. The motion speaks about the province's successful pilot to offer more contactless service options, and that is one way where we're looking at improving service delivery for Islanders. Contactless service is now a permanent option for Islanders. The current programs available by phone and email will continue, such as renewing driver's licenses and vehicle registration, make address changes and request driver abstracts and personalized license plates. And the number of services we are able to offer in this manner will continue to grow as we work with the various departments of government to make programs and services more accessible for Islanders. As an example, we have recently signed a service partnership agreement with the Administration of Energy Efficiency Programs in the Department of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. This is helping move Islanders. Um, this is helping more Islanders to get approved more quickly. And as Contact BI grows, it will be the first point of contact for citizens and businesses seeking government information and programs. And Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things here that's been going on in the department. Um, Access PEI performs around 350,000 transactions per year and collects um, revenues through those transactions for the government of PEI so that we can invest in healthcare, so that we can invest in education, and so we can invest in social programs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, currently Service PEI is performing numerous administration tasks for, uh, for ECA. Uh, a couple of examples, efficiency PEI uh, equipment rebates, 4,500 plus transactions in the current fiscal year in $6 million in rebates to Islanders. Wait times have been reduced from 77 days to 6.7. So we went from 77 days to 6.7 days since the inception of the service PEI model. The electric vehicle program, 355 incentives this fiscal plus shipping for uh, free chargers. Average wait times for dealerships has been six days for payment. The free heat pump program, 1,360 current applications. The program commenced in December of 2021. Again, ECA and the Service PEI Strategic Partnership Agreement uh, was a response to the 2015 Auditor General Report. And I'm extremely, extremely proud of the work that's being done within the department um, and cross-departmentally. Um, um, the staff are, are doing amazing things and they have their sights really set on, on just expanding the level of service, expanding the, the uh, options that are provided. Mr. Speaker, uh, as an example, uh, we're looking right now at uh, tying in uh, vital statistics into what we uh, can provide through our, our service PEI uh, sites and, and, and services. But that's not the end of it, Mr. Speaker. Again, we're, we want to work with the federal government too to see what uh, services that we can we can uh, uh, on, on board with with our uh, very capable staff so that at the end of the day um, there's no question about where you need to go to get this you don't need to stop and think okay so do I need to go to Grafton Street do I need to go to the Jane Canfield building do I need to phone this person or that person no you'll have one point of access and you will be able to Pardon me? Cornwall. <laughs> and you will be able to get all of those services provided, whether it be on the phone, uh, email, or in person. Mr. Speaker, the current programs available by phone and email will continue, such as renewing driver's licenses. Um, and with Contact PEI responding to more frequently asked questions, we will also be able to expand how Access PEI currently provides service. Access PI staff will be able to focus on services that address more complex needs and better support diverse populations. Mr. Speaker, the ways in which Islanders want to interact with government continues, continues to evolve, and as a government, we have to meet Islanders where they are. That could be Cornwall. Delivering a positive uh, citizen experience means improved outcomes for Islanders and greater public trust and confidence in government. As we review the most efficient and effective ways to provide services to residents of Queen County, 
we will certainly be looking at all options. So, Mr. Speaker, just in closing, I again want to thank the Honourable Member for bringing this motion forward. Um, and um, as I say, stated to him a couple of days ago, we have had uh, preliminary discussions already with, uh, with uh, Mayor McCourt and the CAO of Cornwall. Uh, we've also uh, uh, asked them to, uh, to help us uh, with, uh, with seeing if uh, we can get uh, some of the Service Canada um, work that could go under uh, one roof uh, when and if we do to go to Cornwall. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll conclude my comments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to Cornwall Meadowbank for bringing forward this motion, your first one as elected member of this House. And uh, as the member alluded to in his comments, our districts uh, join, uh, abut each other. And uh, he mentioned a couple of communities within District 17 uh, that would be well served by uh, a potential access PEI site in Cornwall. And I can't disagree with that. I suspect they'd be even better served if it was in Crapo rather than in Cornwall, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm not going to amend the motion to that effect. <laughs> I think you'd probably find 27 different locations, uh, mover of this motion, should you, uh, should you look for them. Anyway, my district, you know, PEI is a tiny province. My district sits right in the middle and exactly equidistant between Charlottetown and Summerside. So, uh, there's lots of lovely things about that. Many of the folks who live in District 17 will commute to Charlottetown for work. Many of them commute to Summerside for work. Many of them are lucky enough to work within District 17 itself. But a large number of folks from District 17 out of necessity have to go either to get to work or to access services. Now, of course, Prince Edward Island is a much more rural uh, province than any other province in Canada. Uh, we still have a large number of islanders, over 50% of islanders still live in rural PEI, and of course that's a, the definition of that is, is a moving target. But a lot of folks live in rural PEI because it's a beautiful place to live. But the sacrifice one makes is that you are further away from some essential services, whether that be hospitals, healthcare generally, schools, of course we used to have schools scattered all over this island, so one didn't have to walk any more than a few kilometers to get to school. That was why there were so many of them back then. But of course, we've consolidated a number of those services, and that would be true for government services as well. It was interesting to hear the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure talk about how much shorter the wait times are now in his department. I only wish he'd been so successful when he was the Minister of Health and Wellness <laughs> in reducing those, those wait times there. But, but good for you, Minister. You're not alone there. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. Oh, I was just. Honourable uh, members, the hour has been called. Uh, I turn the beat. Uh, I turn the beat for the second bit by some side will Shilla Carey. The Honourable Member for Moncule Kilmuir and the Government Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the member from Cornwall Meadowbank that this House now adjourn until Wednesday, March 9th at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Shilla Carey. Yeah. Good job, member.